Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Veil, where we discuss subjects of high strangeness and things that challenge what we know of reality. I'm your host, Mike Hughes. And I'm your co-host, Christian Julian. And today we're going to be speaking about owl synchronicities and UFO abductees. Yes, that's right. And in today's episode, we had the pleasure of speaking with Mike Cleland. Mike is the author of the acclaimed book, The Messengers, a captivating research novel that delves into the profound connections between owl sightings, synchronicities, ancient archetypes, dreams, personal transformation, and even death. His work unravels the role of owls in mythic legends of our past and sheds light on their pivotal presence in the lives of those who have encountered UFO phenomenon. With deep insights and thought-provoking narratives, Mike Cleland has become a respected figure in the realm of unexplained phenomenon. Let's welcome Mike Cleland to the show. Mike, thanks for joining us. It's my honor. It's my honor. Thank you. Uh, and let's just kind of let's just kind of get right into it. You know what really uh, it, it sparked your interest in connecting these dots between owl sightings, synchronicities, and, and UFO abductees. I had a personal experience, a set of personal experiences in 2006, that uh, that brought the the issues right up to the forefront. And I, after that, I um, I started writing about them, writing about owls in particular. And in doing so, uh, I put it on my blog, Owls in, the, in Their Connection to UFOs. I put it on my blog, and, and what happened was, this was around 2009 or so when I really started to, to uh, address this stuff. And what happened was I became, if you Googled UFOs and owls, I was the first thing to show up on the feed and then about the next 15 things under that and that has wow. not changed over you could do it right now you could google me and look me oh excuse me you could just google you don't have to google me you can google ufo owls i'm the first thing that comes up mm -hmm. and and so anyone anywhere in the world who has a experience with a ufo and an owl they're gonna find me in about two mouse clicks so so i'm right so if you're like you have some event you see an owl, the owl flies off, a flying saucer goes over your head. You're going to say like, whoa, the, what, what just happened? It, it, anyone anywhere in the world can find me in about two mouse clicks. At the top of my site, it says, I want to hear your stories. And, and I have been flooded, flooded with stories. I cannot keep up with them. I, I just, in fact, just today, the, it was just ping, ping, ping. I got a bunch wow. today. I, I, I can answer some of them. I wish I could answer all of them. And these oftentimes are very, very heartfelt stories. And... And I, um, how to say this? So, so the in the big totality of the UFO lore, right? So there's like oh, you can't see my arms are way far apart right now. So I'm trying to describe like this huge topic, and and within that topic, like people who have done this, they'll say, oh yeah, the owl thing, yeah, that that shows up. Mm. And th there's this thin little sliver of what seems to be just a tiny part of this big overall subject, and. People have been contacting me with those stories, and I have been trying to see the patterns, trying to figure out the implications of it, which has not been easy. And yeah. it's still very much for me an open-ended mystery. I can dance around what it might mean. I got no problem doing that. But yeah. to say concretely what it does mean, I, I cannot. And I would you would be a fool to listen to me if I did say what I what it means. What I can say is that and I, I used to say owls and UFOs are connected. And I'm backing off a little bit from that. What I'm hmm. saying now is owls are a highly charged human experience. Like an owl, a powerful owl sighting, a mystical owl event. When I got, I just get them by the dozens every week. Yeah. Those, that, that highly charged human experience. And also I would say, it's, if you see a UFO, wow, that's a life-changing event, right? All of a sudden. That it definitely. is. Yeah, so so that would be a highly charged human experience, as well as taking psychedelics. People see owls when they take psychedelics. Mm -hmm. That's really common. Hmm. Oftentimes in a ritual setting, as opposed to mm -hmm. I went to high school in the '70s, kind of a different lore than yeah. people were doing. It wasn't quite a ritual then. It was sort of, but uh, and then um, shamanic initiation, like someone who's studying to be a shaman. This is this is like. There are still active shamans in the world. There's shamanic traditions. There are still people teaching shamanism. 
it's a little bit under the radar, but it's happening out there. And within that community of shamans, it is well understood that the owl plays this mythic role within that within that lore. And so, and then there was a couple more. Um, meditation. I get a lot of stories about people meditating, and an owl will appear. Often, if they're meditating, if they ask a question beforehand, and then death. Owls are, and that's, that's, the owls are symbolic of death. And they seem to show up after someone has died. I get the the lore, the, the, the folklore is that owls show up before someone dies. Mm -hmm. That would be in Shakespeare, in um, Macbeth, in both Macbeth and in Julius Caesar, I think that was the name of the play. Um, there's a owl that shows up that foreshadows death. I have mm -hmm. very few accounts of that in my files. I have lots of accounts of owls showing up after someone has died, most often a parent. Just real quick, I was actually telling Christian that we had two screech owls show up um, right before we started recording the show. And this was this was months ago, but two screech owls showed up, sat on one of our light string lights outside. And my partner is, is very, she's very attuned to what owl symbolism means. We didn't think anything of it. We just thought it was an amazing event because we've never seen two screech owls land. We've heard them off in the distance, but we've never seen them literally fly up and land side by side within feet of us. The following day, and which blew my mind, she had two people die. I'm sorry, one person she found out passed away the following day. And then the other person, I think, passed away a day, I think the day after that. So two people passed away with two owls that showed up. And I'm not sure if the person who she found out, the first person that died, if they actually passed away a day earlier or a couple days before the owls showed up. So it could be either or, but that's when she found out that person died. And then the following day, she, she recognized uh, that another friend that she knew okay. passed away. So where exactly on the calendar it falls, I'm, I'm not so interested in, because I've certainly heard many accounts like that. What I have found is that um, it, the, the owls will show up after, often at the funeral. Mm. I got a bunch that's of so stories weird. of owls showing wow. up at the funeral and um, or at a memorial and if it's not owls it's other birds so birds and death are very well understood within within the lore and so that experience what what you and your partner experience i would argue that that experience is universal is a universal human experience that has been happening to all of us in some degree mm -hmm. to some degree all throughout human history and that if if you turn the clock back you know just a few hundred years and and this happened let's say in the plains of north dakota and you stepped out of your teepee and saw two owls and then found out later that two of your friends your tribe members had died that would be well stood within your mm. tribe we don't live in that world anymore there's people who do there's parts of the world where people still live in what we would, I don't want to use the term primitive, that sort of implies mm -hmm. something, but in cultures that have not been indoctrinated into, let's say, Western materialism. So I, I would argue that that is a normal human experience. It has been mm -hmm. happening. You know, we, someone stepped out of the cave, yeah. you know, it, eons ago and had that same yeah. experience. I'm, I am convinced of that. And it, and it seems like it's, it's a global phenomenon because, I mean, in, in native, in native legend and you know in their uh, traditions you know owls have always represented uh, a variety of things including death um what do you what do you know about that well so like it's the southwest indians like in you know in utah and nevada and in the pueblo indians those there's a very dark ominous lore to owls As someone t so i spoke to a navajo man and i've tried to follow up on this and I haven't been able to but he said he said in his language the owl is the same word as sinister it's really dark like I got the, there's a story of a of a, a native or actually a teacher 
was volunteering to teach at a Navajo reservation. I think it was the Navajo reservation mm -hmm. in Arizona. She had she was volunteering to teach. I think I've got that right at their elementary school. And for graduation, she just went to the, like the office supply store kind of thing and got a bunch of owls, you know, and you thumbtack them to the bulletin board. Whoa, boy, the teacher, the teachers, the families came in and like, you take that down. Those that wow. you do not, those are not, you know, that's not like little kid yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. That's serious, heavy, like a, what would be a totem animal or an archetype mm -hmm. within their culture is that was no joke they were they were like angry take those down and she and they all understood that she didn't know but but it was um i mean she got a she got a she learned her lesson quickly there yeah a lot of passion behind it um and and you mentioned that these like these symbols are they have high energy what does that really mean like uh like these topics or conversations oh i mean well you i mean something it, has more oh go on is it like a, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, is it more like a spiritual energy we're talking about, or are you just talking about like a, uh, like a mentality? When I say highly charged human event? Highly charged, yes, sorry. I, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a catchphrase I use okay. to say, because yes, owls do show up around the time of UFOs. And then I have to, I have to, I very quickly started collecting owl stories. Didn't have anything to do with UFOs, but they had everything to do with the mood or flavor of of. So, you said spirituality. This is a tough one. We're living in a world of materialists, and they wow, oh, yeah. you use the word spirituality in your studies. There, like they're gonna be, they can just see the hackles mm -hmm. going up. But I will say yep. yes, yeah. one hundred percent, a spiritual aspect. Hmm. A okay. a. So I would, so the questions I ask, people come to me with their stories and they ask, or excuse, they, they tell a story, whether it's an owl and a UFO or it's an owl related to someone who has died recently, or it's an owl in relationship to um, a powerful event in their life, like shamanic initiation or like a psychedelic yeah. trip. I would ask, or meditation, I got a lot of meditation stories. I would ask, what was going on in your life before the event? What changed after the event? And so I talk sometimes at conferences and I have a slideshow with like a, a PowerPoint show. And one of the slides is people say, I saw this UFO. I saw this owl. I could tell you some stories, but yeah, I'll tell you, here's tell you one. This guy, Derek got a hold of me and, and he, this is very early on in my studies in one of the first real, like, so he's camping in the desert in Arizona. He's with some friends. He's from the East Coast. He never camped in the desert. So he's, you know, this totally mind-blowing experience. A lot of stars at night in the desert. And, yeah. and him and his friend are, are looking up at the stars, and they notice there's an owl on a cactus looking down at them. Wow. They didn't see it fly in. And they both feel the same thing. They're like, whoa, that's intense. That's spooky. And they both felt this ominous presence. Mm -hmm. owl. And that's normal. People see an owl in the fence in the backyard. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. And they say, ooh, that's, that's a... That's an ominous looking animal, which it is. So everyone, it really is. everyone says that. Oh, everyone says it. Um, some of the little owls are super cute, but the big ones oh, yeah. tend to be really in appearance. So the owl flies off. Moments later, a triangle shaped craft totally hmm. silently flies over where they were lying. And it, they see it. I'm going to use the term UFO. It was unidentified. It flies down the canyon. And this fellow, Derek, I sat with him, and he struggled to describe. Like he said, this thing like hugged the landscape, and, and it was like it wasn't. He was like, this was no helicopter, this was no airplane. It was it hugged the landscape in this way that was so weird. Mm -hmm. And and then he kind of talked about his life afterwards. He said, oh, I started having dreams. I started change my you know things. And he just kind of dropped this little hint. He said, Yeah, I had a spiritual awakening. In the afternoon. Wow. It's like, what? Yeah. He had a spiritual awakening, and that was early on. And I, so it's, I'm not talking about the big totality of all UFO events. I'm talking about the owl and UFO events, the sliver within the big, big picture. It is people have a spiritual awakening in the, yeah. in, the in connection with UFO contact. So I just said, I. To synchronicity so i said earlier i speak at these conferences i have a slide it says big letters spiritual awakening and i stand on stage and i say well people report a spiritual awakening i click the thing and i'm like it's a that's a bold claim to make 
right? So I'm like, well, I yeah. kind of I have it in my files, and I was kind of insecure, and I'm going to go up and talk to these people. I, I feel like I got to project the correct information. I could kind of step back and say some people say that, or it's often I, and then so as I'm thinking, as I'm like, I am like getting ready to go on stage. And I'm thinking, do I take this slide out? It's easy, right? You've got your laptop. You just push a button. You take the slide out. I was like, I should take this slide out. Guy comes up to me and says, Mike, I got an, I got, let's talk before you leave this conference. I got an owl and UFO story. It's really, really intense. I had a spiritual awakening right after it happened. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'm leaving it in. So yeah, yeah. that kind of thing is normal for me at this point. That kind of, yeah. and I'm really open to it. And I, and I, and I have trusted those kinds of synchronistic events. Yeah, I had never really um, heard the correlation between owls and UFOs, except for um, a movie that I saw a couple years back called The Fourth Kind. Have you ever seen that movie at all? Yep. Oh yeah. What do you What do you kind of think of that? You think it? Uh... So, so the movie The Fourth Kind came out in two thousand and nine, and that was it's kind of a low budget horror film. Yeah. And it's it's got it's there for you know it's meant to be spooky and it's got you know like moments where you jump and stuff like that but it, it claimed that this was based on a real event in a town mm-hmm. in alaska i think it was in in uh, anchorage no it wasn't in anchorage it was just the capital i'm drawing a total blank on the capital of anchorage or a capital of alaska right now but anyway it supposedly took place in the capital of alaska and then it was it was based on real events and they even had some things where it was side by side what looked like um archival uh, footage of someone in hypnosis and then it was side by side with the actor being hypnotized yeah. that was totally fake that was that was a publicity stunt well i'm all for a publicity stunt in a in a kind of a lowbrow movie i thought yeah you know, was, that's goes back right to you know barnum and bailey and the, you're allowed to do that so they didn't break any rules but but i it, i would argue what happened was so i didn't come up with the owl and ufo thing Right? Mm-hmm. So other people had noticed that before. Whitley Strieber, most particularly, as far as I can tell, in his book Communion, mm-hmm. had a story of an owl. He had a memory of an owl out his window mm-hmm. early on in the book. And that book is, is, you could trace a lot of our modern UFO abduction lore to that book. So he... Like I think it's on page twenty-seven. I have footnoted it so many times. <laughs> I thought say that's so, a good that's a good memory. Well, I you do it enough. You so so I footnote. I think it's twenty-seven in the in the in the paperback version. Um, so he he had an experience that night where he felt like he was taken by aliens on board a craft or on board. He never said craft. He was on, into some other realm, and mm-hmm. and but his memory was that there was an owl on the windowsill. Now this was. Christmas Day. That was the night of Christmas Day. So that was the night of December 25th. The next morning, December 26th, he wakes up. He tells his wife, like, wow, I had this weird experience last night. And there was an owl on the windowsill. I I saw it last night. There was an owl looking in from the windowsill. And he had a clear memory of it. They went up to the windowsill, and there was no, there was fresh snow or snow that had been there for a few days. So it wasn't fresh. And then there were no footprints in the snow or on the roof line, just out past where the, where the where there should. If there had been an owl on that windowsill, there would have been footprints or, yeah, footprints. Yeah. So they so, so this is there's this mystical aspect. Like, what did he see? Where did mm-hmm. that memory come from? So that that moment was the first point in pop culture, where in a nonfiction book. Owls and UFO contact have were tied together. That's only like 1987 when that book came wow. out. That's not that long ago. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, I would argue that the people who wrote the script for The Fourth Kind tapped into that. And then since yeah. then, it shows up in all kinds of other books. Uh, John Mack book, John Max, Dr. John Mack, who is a professor from Harvard, wrote a book called, called Passport to the Cosmos, and he addresses owls in that book. And mm-hmm. I know that... Um, Bud Hopkins addressed owls in later books. He addressed other animals first that show up in in connection with UFOs. One of them would be deer. Deer and owls are the top two. And then below that, there's a bunch of other animals that seem to show up. But yeah. deer and owl are top on the list. I have, I've never heard the deer aspect. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's an interesting mm-hmm. it's one. All over the, it's all over it, yeah. One thing I think is interesting is like um, kind of listening to a couple podcasts and stuff you've been on is 
you know, they kind of add like a horror aspect to that relationship, but you kind of speak about it as more of a, a peaceful or uh, a positive experience in, in a way. And I thought that was kind of interesting, just kind of that, that difference between the two. So, um, maybe I'm, peaceful is not the right word, but so I would say, so what happened was I collected, started collecting these stories again, I'm not looking at the big totality. I'm looking at this little sliver. And what I found is that, um, Gary stories, I guess certainly got some stories where people's lives felt like they came mm -hmm. unraveled. I certainly talked to a lot of people who are just like traumatized from the fear and the unknown of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that's there. And I tell those stories in the book. And I don't want to belittle those stories. I don't want to ignore those stories, right? I, you know, so I've been in the little, like at, at UFO conferences, they ha oftentimes are, the, there's support meetings, right? So abductees, support meetings. People who feel they've been abducted by aliens go into a support group meeting and they sit in a circle, just like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And they say, hello, my name is Mike. And I feel like I've been abducted by a UFO. It's a little, that's more, that's like, I'm, I'm, doing a little parody of a Alcoholics yeah. and yeah, yeah. meeting, but it's essentially that. And wow, have I seen like someone says, oh, they're my space brothers. And then the person who's like sitting next to him, like they ain't my space brothers. No, -uh. <laughs> they're like, mm, I'm, I'm, like, they're mad. They're like, they're, I mean, it's, dark. I mean, the, so the you get a fluctuation. Thing, yeah. Ooh, ooh. Imagine, so. So yeah. And like, I mean, it's not quite fisticuffs in the, in the room there, but let me tell you, I've watched some people storm out and, yeah. and uh, so, so wow. it's both. It's both. Okay. And then to ignore one, well, you could easily do that. You could easily get a big stack of UFO books on your desk and cherry pick the, the, the stories you want to tell. Mm -hmm. But in doing that, you would have to willingly ignore a percentage, whether, whether it's 50% or f what I can say in my studies, the benevolent stories outweigh the negative or m mm -hmm. malevolent stories. I'm going to 70, I'll say. That doesn't mean that the 30% that are having bad experiences are wrong mm -hmm. or that they're, or they're not having those experiences. Maybe that's just how they perceived it. Ooh, well, I'm going to be really careful. So, so, so that's like, sh that's like, I don't want to like shame. Like it's, I don't want to make, I don't want their right. fault, right? Because that's, right. I've seen a lot of people say like, oh, if you just accepted it and it's accepted yeah. it in your heart and and saw the world as a magnificent, beautiful place, then you would have nice experiences and like, mm, oh, yeah, yeah. what about the parent who's like, kid is, well, that's the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in this in this work is the parents who say, you know, my kids get up in the morning and they say these little beings came in, the, like an owl looked in the window mm. and the next thing there was a, there were these little doctors that took, that my little child draws these scary gray aliens and said the little doctors took them away on a, into a white room. Yeah, oh, the like that would be hard to handle. Hearing that from a kid. Yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty I, so heavy. So I talked to one guy. This guy has actually had a rough go of it. And so he, I spoke at a UFO conference, and I do a talk, right? And I got the PowerPoint, and it's you can do the little sound effects, right? You can, like, there's a way to push a button. So I just record, like, and I say, oh, and then someone, I'll tell you. So here's a story. Is, forgive me if I'm jumping around too much. No, go ahead. Here's mm. the story that I told. A friend of mine, Suzanne Chancellor, who has used to have her own podcast, is very open about her experiences, was hearing night after night, she lives in the suburbs of Providence, Rhode Island, and night after night, out the window, she was hearing the sound of an owl. Hmm. And, and there came a day when she, she heard it in the yard, it was nighttime, she said, I'm going to record it for me. She said, I'm going to record this for Mike. So she went out with her phone. She's got a little app, app on the phone that you can do a voice memo. So she, she was going to record it. Yeah. And there was a, it's an apple tree right between her yard and her neighbor's yard. So she's walking up to the apple tree, and she can hear the owl in the apple tree. And she puts the phone up to the apple tree, and then all of a sudden, there's like she never sees the owl. She sees a bright orange orb floating in wow. the tree. It lasts for a little bit, and then whoosh, disappears. There's no owl sound after that. So wow. she went to find an owl. She heard it, and then it disappeared. Now, I'm putting together the presentation. I want to tell that story. And I have a lot of stories like that. In fact, that 
the, this fellow Mike, his name is also Mike, I'll get to him in a second, has a story almost exactly like that. So I am trying to put the little audio file, like it should just drag and drop right into the, yeah. to the, to the um, PowerPoint presentation. Right? There's a way to do it. And it wasn't working. It wasn't working. I couldn't. I couldn't. It was just wasn't. I couldn't transfer it. I couldn't get it off the website. You know, like it was a, it was an MP3, but I couldn't download it off the website. And I stayed up late, and I had to go to the conference the next morning. It was a long drive. I was in upstate New York. The conference was in Maine. And I, and I, oh, I was so frustrated. And I just went to bed, and I'm like, oh, screw it. Like, I'm not doing it. Like, they don't get a sound effect. Yeah. It was the sound of a eastern screech owl which makes a super defined noise oh yeah they do so it takes it sounds like a, it's like i say it sounds like a barbie horse like a horse yeah, that they, barbie they make ride. some they make some bizarre noises i it's funny because i have a, a a a recording on youtube that i found and when we hear the owls the screech owls making noise we'll actually play it on a loudspeaker and they will actually come to the house like oh, in the that's trees very, that's very common yeah it's really really cool but anyways yeah. continue so the um I have the little sound effect, and it couldn't load up, so I went to bed, frustrated. I had to get up early the next morning to do this long drive. And my partner at the time was this woman, Andrea, and we were, um, we were lying in bed, and the sun was just starting. Just you could just get the hint that the sun was coming up outside, and right out the window, I'd never heard it before, was an eastern screech owl. And I was awake, and Andrea obviously was totally awake because she just went, "Was that an owl?" And I, and it was like, I, I was like, I took it 100% as a sign. I have to put this audio track in the thing. So what I ended up doing is I just took my phone and I just held my phone up to the, to the, to the <laughs> thing and I loaded it up to my phone and I held it up to the microphone and so I just cheated and did it that way. So um, I play that at the conference. This guy named Mike comes up to me at the, after I give my talk. There's a point and I say, oh, and then Suzanne walked up to the tree and she could hear the sound of the Eastern Screech Owl and I push a button and it makes a woo. little sound effect he comes up to me and says um i almost fell out of my chair during your talk when you gave that when you played that owl sound effect oh boy and i hear that sound coming out of his baby monitor oh Oh, no Ooh, like talk about move. Like, so so but and, that this, is so the, and i and i've since become quite good friends with him and his son is doing great and everything and so but wow that was that i didn't have any, like how do i'm like uh, that was hard for me to hear yeah yeah and, and how i mean what can you even say to that i mean i mean that's i can say he's not alone that yeah. other people i've never heard that exact story hearing something through the baby monitor but i've certainly heard lots of parents tell of their kids feeling that owls are coming in the room at night so so mike in your book i mean you have an amazing collection of of different owl stories but in in even in your book and even somebody who pays attention to to ufo lore and history i mean you see these you hear these hear about these owl connections but one of the striking things about these owl connections is the fact that as, as you mentioned in some of your stories in your book, that a person may be driving down the road and all of a sudden they see a four-foot owl. Yep. Or they see owls of enormous size or bizarre in stature. So the real question is, is what do you think these, are these really flesh and blood owls or are these some type of like psychic um, projections that people, or is it both? is the real question. So I know that some people, when they encounter owls and, and uh, have UFO connections with it, sometimes they see normal looking owls. So it seems like there's a variety of different shape and sizes. And I, I know some, from some of your stories that people would see these four or five foot tall owls, and it was almost like they would just accept what they saw, which was even almost as bizarre as the fact that they just saw a five foot tall owl on the side of the road. Can can you kind of talk and discuss about some of these variety of like of how people see a, a, a difference in, in what these owls are and how they interpret these owls? Sure. If I got the window open, if you need me to close it, so the car just I put you on mute for a second. A car just went by. It was kind of loud, but oh, you're um, fine. Okay. So that what you're describing is in the lore is called a screen memory. So if you talk to people who have the 
So there's two things going on. I'm convinced there's two things going on. One is the screen memory aspect. So you talk to a UFO researcher and you say, do you have any stories about owls in your files? And they go, huh, pff, owls show up all the time. We get owls all the time. People talk, oh, owls are really normal. And then they'll describe the screen memory aspect of it. So, um, uh, I, I mean, I have a lot. So here's one story. Do you know who Dolores Cannon was? She died, I think, in 2015. Uh, I, I know the name. I cannot she, quite she remember who exactly she of, is. Yeah, she did a series of books. She was this funny, cute grandmother character. Mm -hmm. And she, like her presence did not match her the weirdness of her research. Mm -hmm. So she was. she did a series of books where she would hypnotize people, often for normal things like you know quitting smoking and weight loss and mm -hmm. reducing stress and sleeping better and then they would just start spontaneously talking and telling this account and then she would finish up the hypnosis session and then the next person would come into the office and they would pick up right where the other person left off and they would continue on in this account and these these accounts wow. she's got like big fat books are really popular too <laughs> so and i met her a few times but she died in 2015 if i'm not mistaken so she had an experience she wrote about it in one of her books and she was working this was going back i think into the early 1980s and she was doing straight family therapy right she was working with with she was a clinician she was a trained hypnotherapist she was using hypnosis for normal what we would call normal things minimizing um minimizing stress and weight loss and quitting smoking and that kind of stuff yeah. but she was getting this people would start talking about ufos while they were under they would be like oh okay like here's your little mantra for quitting smoking and the person would say yeah i'm on this table and i'm like been taken by these little beings and so she she didn't know what to do and and that's so she kind of she had to she there was a point she was talking they had a they had a, a monthly meeting with the people at their clinic, and she sat with the people the, her coworkers and she said this stuff is showing up in my work and I got to decide do I like do I follow this, or do I just do I ignore it like I got to mm -hmm. decide whether I follow it or ignore it. That night she drives home, and she lives in she was living in Arkansas she's on a country road in Arkansas. And she sees a big owl in the road. And she pull, she's driving a truck. She pulls right up to it. And she describes the owl's head looking at her over the hood of the truck. Well, let me tell <laughs> wow. you, like, God. like, you can take the smallest car in the world and the biggest owl. Yeah. And then that's not going to be able to look over the like big, you know. So, yeah, so, yeah. so she's describing something that shouldn't happen. And she just, she was just like, oh, this big owl, like, looked in, like. And then the owl would fly down the road, stop. And then she'd pull up to it again. And it would fly down the road and stop. Wow. And put, so so then it took a letter right to the door. And it, the owl stopped at her door or at the at her driveway. She pulled into the driveway. And then she told her son, like, oh, you know, I saw this, like, four foot, four and a half foot, five foot tall owl. He's like, mom, there's no such thing. She later went to a museum in, uh, she was on a speaking tour. This was many years later. And, and there was a, this was in the Natural History Museum of London. And there was a big glass case, and it had every size owl. It was a big, long thing. took up a long hallway, and she walked along and looked at every single owl. None of them looked like what she saw. And she was like, I don't think that was an owl I saw that night. Mm -hmm. So what she is describing is the screen memory aspect of it, where the implication is, like, I don't know what's true and what's not, but the implication is that these beings either use technology like they push a button or they use psychic means they just kind of mm, psychically zap the observer yeah. so the witness then thinks that they have that they're looking at an owl as opposed to a gray alien mm -hmm. the questions i ask people in my studies when they come with me with these stories i ask it just there's a handful of questions i try to ask everyone one what was going on in your life leading up to the event two what changed after the event Not, you know like and so if I asked Dolores Cannon, she I don't have to ask her. She wrote it. She wrote it in a book. It was very clear. Leading up to the event, she said, I got to decide whether I'm going to go down this weird UFO path. After the event, obviously she did. She's put yeah. out like 10 books. So, and they're like important in the lore and they are highly spiritual books. So, um, so that was a long answer. I'll give you one more story here. So I, um, uh, I live in a big house and there's a bunch of roommates here and I ended up here because I just 
I knew some friend of mine and she's downstairs right now. And she, <laughs> this is, she has one of the best stories I've ever heard about. So she, she was as a 16 year old girl, she was working as a 19, she was 19. As a 19 year old girl, she was working at a summer camp for girls and she was in the back country camping with the girls and there was like one set of tents here and there was another set of tents here and there was a trail connecting the two campsites it was just the two best campsites were the flat terrain where you could set up the tent campsites so she's walking on a trail between them this is this was way this is not like an organized campground in the front country so she's like walking between the two campsites and she turns a corner now let me just add that she had had experiences where she very clearly knew that she had been having contact events in her life. Yeah. And she, she, they'd always, so it always happened at night. So full daylight, bright, beautiful day. She turns a corner on the path. There was a gray alien with this yeah. big bald head and the shiny black eyes and the skinny body standing right next to the path. And she looks at it and it looks at, at her. And there's, um, so every she's she's a great storyteller this is a funny story in some ways so like when people report contact with these beings all communication is telepathic the, the aliens lips don't move yeah so she looks at this thing and she hears this telepathic voice in her head go owl 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 and she watches this <laughs> thing morph like into an into an owl and wow. then she sees it turn around and run into the woods and and so there's an event where the like seemingly one this being got caught off guard and and i have a couple of stories like that in my files that one's the most that one's the yeah. most you know that one's the funniest i'll put it that way <laughs> so, i remember that oh, i remember that one in your book oh i'd be yeah. freaking out i wouldn't <laughs> mm, people freak out yeah, this is, yeah i've talked to a lot of people like that's it's something yeah i get a lot of calls within 24 hours of an event where people yeah. are kind of freaked out so so what what do you think these interactions are for what do you think they're why that like why do you think they're happening so are you talking about the ufo interactions or the owl as part of the, the interaction um i guess well i guess I like can't these, answer, uh, i can't answer either of them but i can dance around and i'll, I'll yeah i can tell you what i might think might be going on so yeah i guess more the owls when people are seeing them i mean i know you you, you kind of perceive these gray aliens as being in control of this imagery but like do you think it's just like someone randomly came across one of these entities or do you think like there's a purpose in why they saw that i always feel like the eyes have something to do with it like when you look at like a gray, a typical gray alien eyes and then owl eyes there's always like that very piercing type of look but that's that's my only real theory on it that's that's what that's what a lot of ufo researchers say and then but so 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 it's the, the two screen memories at the top of the list are owls and deer deer also have big black piercing eyes mm -hmm. right well, deer you see a deer deers are cute they don't have the same ominous energy right do you see a deer in your backyard it's not ominous yeah. um you see an owl in your backyard it's like ooh, that's got a different feel so so they're both nocturnal in a way deer can you mm. see them at night and they're both, they would be unsurprising to see, right? So if you saw a deer on the side of the road, if you saw an owl on the side of the road, if you saw a deer looking in your window, if you saw an owl looking in your window, you could kind of say like, oh, that's possible. But so my, my more nuanced answer, which I have, this is just what feels right. doesn't make it right. Yeah. But it feels right is that the owl is an archetype. And by an archetype, I mean that that we are all all of us somehow in our DNA, we have an inner knowledge of what an owl means. That might be very hard to explain no, what the owl I, means, but are we it's feel ingrained. It. Yeah, it's, it's part Just of our serpent. Country. Serpent would be the same thing. I mean, people have a serpent. natural oh. connection. Well, uh, lots of things, right? So, so like you see, um, you go to see Star Wars. Right, you sit in the theater, and then up on there's Luke Skywalker up on the screen. He's fighting with his lightsaber. You're watching an adventure movie. Mm -hmm. You are seeing the archetype of the hero. You are you are watching the archetype of the hero. Luke Skywalker is is just a character, but at a much deeper level, he is the archetype of a hero. That was there was a that was very that was done on purpose when George Lucas did the original Star Wars series. Definitely, he based it on the works of 
Joseph Campbell in, in, mm -hmm. in the book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. So he, so that's an archetype. But we can, we can totally get immersed in the story. And we can totally get immersed in the, in the, in the lore of the UFO. But, but I would cautiously speculate that the, that the UFO occupants are using the owl because it is an archetype that we can all tap into. Um, so here, let me kind of talk about the mythology of the owls a little Absolutely, bit. Absolutely, you can. Yeah, go ahead. So, so anyone, anywhere in the world, recognizes that the owl can fly at night in the forest, right? They yeah. fly at night. They have silently. these great big eyes. They fly silently. They have amazing, amazing animals. If back, turn like right from the dawn of man, they would have known that owls fly in the darkness. Now, we live in a world where we have electric light bulbs, right? So it's, so mm -hmm. nighttime no longer has the, 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 the mythos, no longer has the lore that it once did. Right? So, boy, just a couple generations, my great-grandfather, wow. Before the electric light, that was owls, excuse me, the night meant something totally, something totally different to him when he couldn't flip a light switch or use a flashlight. Now, the owl flies into the darkness that, that becomes a metaphor for flying to the land of the gods, for flying to the land of the ancestors, for flying to that other realm, traveling to that other realm, passing beyond our realm into that other realm. You take that one step further, the owl would come back with a message. Mm -hmm. That's ancient lore mm -hmm. modern lore harry potter he's like he's like the that's the most popular book in the history of publishing most popular series of books in the history of publishing and so harry potter has an owl that delivers the mail mm -hmm. it's right there embedded into our popular culture and it's not like hidden somewhere it's right there wow it doesn't get any more like embedded into the psyche of our of our pop culture mm -hmm. than harry potter so that lore is still with us you know right now no matter how it's showing up in the form of fiction i don't care mm -hmm. that's fine that doesn't make any difference to me but the lore the mythos the, the 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 that that buried knowing is still right there and we and we just it's just part of us clash of the titans the the, the mechanical owl that was my favorite one <laughs> bubo it was, yeah, yeah. It's such a such a good bubo bubo is latin for a certain a name of, yeah. of a certain species of owls yeah so so athena that was uh, the goddess athena yep. had um a companion little owl so she's the goddess of wisdom and so that's where you get the wise owl that's mm. where you get the 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 owl with the graduation cap that you can't put on the wall in in the elementary schools and in, in Indian reservations in in uh, Arizona, so that's that comes the wise owl comes straight from goddess Athena. Let's let's talk about some of the you know if you can if you can just talk about some of the personal connections that you have, like some of your owl stories. Um, what profound connections have you had, or moments where you've you've encountered owls, and has it had any type of like transformation on? you i mean this work itself has clearly had to have had some type of an impact on how you view reality you know how what re, what what sightings and and, and uh, encounters have you had this has been per, very personal so there i had an event in 2006 i'm i was 44 years old i'm 60 now so when i'm in 2006 i was living in um a little town in Idaho, right near Grand Teton National Park. And I was working for an outdoor school at the time. So I would spend my summers. Wow, would I live the life? Oh, man, did I live the dream? <laughs> I would spend the summers teaching mountaineering in Alaska. It was so, it, oh, it was so fun. Yeah, that does and sound then I epic. would come down to the lower 48 at the end of spending the summer up there. And I would live in, I was living right next to Yellowstone National Park and right near the Tetons. And they had a branch of the school that I worked for. Excuse me. And there was this young woman who was working at the school. And she had been at the, at the, in the Tetons, which is Grand Teton National Park. She'd been there all summer. All summer, you must have camped a lot. And she said, no, I didn't camp once. I'm like, I'll take you camping. So it sounds kind of weird, but it was kind of a first date. With in, but in that culture, that kind of outdoor culture, it was pretty common, just like, yeah, let's go camping for a first date. So I said, one night, and I, and it was going to be a beautiful weather. I could just, you could just look out. There's a way to look at the clouds and the clear sky, and you could check the weather. It wasn't going to rain. 
Well, let's go out for one night. We're not taking a tent. We're going to just sleep on the ground under the stars. So yeah. we, we went out and, oh, we, had, I, we sat in this beautiful spot in, and I was making dinner. I was totally in my element. I'd been working outside all summer. I was making dinner and I was like, and she was talking and she was telling me something. I was like really struck. It was spiritual. She was talking spiritual stuff. And I was like, like, whoa, I got not <laughs> expect this. Like some stranger, like let's go camping. And then we're like having this really, really, really deep conversation. And at that moment, and then a second owl. Wow. And then a third owl. And these three owls flew around us and flew near us and landed near us. We eventually like went to camp and laid down on the ground and we put our sleeping pads down and we looked up at the sky and I mean this is trillions of stars. This like northern Rockies whoa. And and these the the stars would be blotted out there just for like just a half a second. And these owls wow. are flying right over our face. They don't make any noise when they fly. Wow, was it trippy. And the next day we were like, whoa, that was cool. Yeah, that's and, rare. Yeah. And so super cool. After we got done, I said, let's, hey, let's go camping. If you want to go camping, let's go camping again. She's like, I would love that. It's great. So four days later, we go camping again. Totally different part of the mountains. Sun is setting. Let's say, let's walk up to that hilltop and watch the sunset. So we walk up to the top of the hill. As soon as we get to the top of the hill, this owl lands on a branch right next to us. And this other owl flies around. And the third owl lands at our feet. Before, mm. four days earlier, they are kind of over there. They'd be on that branch a little bit over there. No, uh -uh, this time they were like right next to us. And I just remember the look on her face like this total like, <gasps> like astonishment <laughs> as she is like this owl is at our feet looking up at us. That's incredible. It was, a, it was 11 inches tall. It was not a, it was not four foot tall. It was like, it was just the size owls are supposed to be. Yeah. And, and not, uh, not typically what owls do. I've talked to owl biologists and told them this story. And I just feel like the crazy uncle at the family reunion. They don't like that way. <laughs> you know, so, so, um, what they don't believe you? Eh, they, uh, uh, he didn't believe me. <laughs> he wow. did not believe me. I mean, it's so. not typical for a wild owl to do that, no. but I mean, but you know, it's, it's clearly, I mean, when it's, when you have something of that caliber happening, I mean, there, there's something to it. So, so I didn't say it at the time, and I'm saying it now. And I've told this story many times, so I'm comfortable saying this, but wow, this was like, we were looking at those two nights, four days apart, same person, different part of the mountains. I'm convinced there's the same three owls. Mm. I, I can't prove that obviously, but I feel pretty strong that it's the same three owls. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm like, like I'm looking at these owls, little cute owls, and I hear a voice in my head that says, this has something to do with the UFOs. Mm. Wow. And I'm like, it's incredible. Now, 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 I growing up, I had close-up UFO sighting when I was twelve. I had a missing time event when I was twelve, and that was in association with a bright orange light in the sky. And then a little more telling, when I was thirty, so this was I would have been forty-four, so fourteen years earlier, before the owl event in the in the mountains, I had an event where I was in bed. <laughs> I was living in Maine at the time, and I s there was a bright light shining in the window, and I looked out the window, there were five gray aliens walking towards the house. Jesus. And I, it should have been scary. I, I was just like, whoosh, like yeah. totally, whoosh, like every emotion was sucked out of me, and I had heard this voice that said, oh, yes, they're here. Now is the time to close your, to put your head on the pillow. Now is the time to put your head on the pillow and shut down. And that's just what I did. I just like, what? Put my head on the pillow and wow. was out like that. That's so, unbelievable. So I had those events in my life. I could tell every single one of those stories. I yeah. could tell them around the campfire. I could tell them at, you know, on a long drive. Yeah. I could tell them in dinner time. And I was like, like I knew what they implied, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't go in there. Like, no way, not me. Uh uh. Yeah. I'm not going there. So after this stuff with so it wasn't just that i saw owls i was we were like both this her name is Kristen. both Kristen and i very early on 2006 was very early on early on when you could actually google something and we were searching out like you know spirit meaning of the owl and mm -hmm. what is the totem animal of the owl what is the mythology of the owl and oh my both of us were on fire we're just like what to have, yeah. I mean, to have it happen once was pretty cool but have it happen twice but twice like, yeah oh, yeah it was pretty freaky so so and then I started a blog in 2009. 
and then just before I was starting the blog, I started to reach out to UFO researchers, and I would say like, oh, you know, I had, you know, I think I'm with because I had these stories growing up, and I said I have these stories and these memories, and I'm not sure what to make of it, and and then I would always ask like, hey, you know, like, do you get any owl stories, weird owl stories? And they're like, oh yeah, we get owl stories, and so these researchers, Leo Sprinkle, he's since passed on, was one. He would he would give me a phone number. He said, here, Mikey, this is a person you should talk to, and I'd call him up. We'd have long, long, long talks, and and I would ask them, "Do you have any experiences?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, get all, I've had a lot of owl experiences." So I started. That's when I started collecting them, the owl stories, mm -hmm. and and I put up the story I told about camping with Kristen, the owls. I put that on my blog, and after I put it on my blog, that was when I started my blog. Was initially just about synchronicities. I didn't. It didn't. I wasn't even. Didn't even cross my mind that I was going to go down the UFO rabbit hole. Yeah. It was only about synchronicities. I got a lot of them. I got a lot of fun. They're fun stories. They make a perfect blog post. But I I wrote it in the story. Kristen was talking about something really touching, mm -hmm. spiritual. I called her up and I said, this is after I published this, 2009. Three years later, we were still in touch. I still talk with her. She's good. We're good friends. And and uh, she's. <laughs> I said, what were we talking about? The very first night, we saw the very first owls. And she said, oh, I remember exactly what we were talking about. I was giving my most heartfelt definition of what God means to me. Oh, wow. And so I'm not necessarily, let's say, churchy, mm -hmm. but I certainly recognize, like, the power of, of God. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. like, of, of the implication of talking about God at that moment. And I have a lot of stories about people having heart-to-heart -heart about God. And yeah. then a novel shows up that that seems to be yeah. that, I mean synchronicities synchronicities alone have proven to me in my and I'm only speaking for myself but have proven to me that there is a higher power because I've had so many bizarre synchronicities that cannot be ignored in my life and it's now they're they're so common to me and my my partner that we just kind of we I just laugh now like it's always been positive some of the some of the even most negative things that have ever happened in my life when I look back I can see how that was basically just wind in my sail to push me in another direction so synchronicities synchronicities can come in all shapes and sizes flavors could be good bad but to me they've always been positive in the end they they've just been they've been the proverbial breadcrumbs so to speak in my life and that's how i've i've encountered uh and 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 digested uh synchronicity so to speak yeah and i'm i'm uh, we talked about this a little bit before that we pushed the rec or you pushed the record button but i say like i am no i i am no longer allowing myself to be astonished mm -hmm. right because astonishment is like to me that's like that's like adrenaline pumping through your body that's like, that's unhealthy if it happens mm -hmm. too much. I give myself permission to be in awe. Yeah. Like I am in awe. And that's a different emotional state yeah. than astonishment. So I am in awe. I would agree with that. And someone contacted me at a, at a UFO conference. I was going to a lot of UFO conferences for a while. It was really helpful. And I mean, re to talk to people and that had similar experiences. Wow, was it helpful. So I... Someone came up to me and said, so what, what, what's, like, how's, what's going on? Why are you here? And I said, well, I think I might have these contact experiences in my life. And it's like, wow, okay. And, and so how has your life changed? And I'm like, and I thought about it and I said, I now live in a magical universe. Mm -hmm. And I really believe that. I really yeah. feel that. That's so. very well put. Very well put. And just for some clarification, um, when you saw these owls, you, you heard this voice did that remind you of the experiences you had when you were young or had, do you remember them and kind of grew up with them and just kind of try to forget about them or not think too much about them? Or did that voice kind of snap you back to those experiences? So I could, I always knew about those experiences. Okay, they were okay. always there. They were always part of me. You know, a couple little details were kind of a little, like, I feel like I've put the puzzle pieces together better now, but they were always there. So what had happened was, is that, there was like kind of a little like in the back of my mind, I was like, I got to look into this someday. I'm going to have to look into this someday, but not yet. 
like I'm not oh I'm not no I'm not yet. Yeah. So it's like uh, so so there's this kind of like the way I describe it is you know when you like put the tea kettle on, mm -hmm. like be before it whistles, even before the noise comes out. There's like this you're like in the kitchen you know that the you know that the tea kettle's just about to you know and that's what it felt like my life felt like that it's like I got to look into this I don't want to I'm gonna have to look into this someday. I had the owl experience. It was like that was that just pushed me through, across the across that line, and I started looking into my own experiences. So you you you're the way you phrased the question about my personal owl experiences. Do you have anything that events that were transformational? I'm not sure what word you use, but that's sort of what you're yeah. implying. Yeah. I my life was going along one way. Wow, did I have the dream life? You know, like camping in Alaska and just like, and then I had this experience in 2006 where I saw real owls, they, mm -hmm. like little owls, real owls, heard a voice in my head. There was no UFO, except in the message in my mind, this has something to do with UFOs. Mm -hmm. I tell you, I am not exaggerating. My life like just made a hard right turn. Mm -hmm. Nothing was the same after that. Wow. Yeah. So, and and in, in the same thing where you were talking about the, the like the, 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 the synchronicity but this mm -hmm. is like this feels more than a synchronicity this feels like almost like a preordained moment i mean that was powerful um but it but it feels like like in the how to say this there's like like if you if i take a few steps back and look at my story my life story as mm -hmm. a novel i would say like oh this had to happen like the script writer of my novel had to put this event in or I never would have, or I never would have followed up and looked into mm -hmm. these things. Absolutely. What did that like experience change about you? Like, what, did it change just your like your, your outlook on life, or like your spirituality, or all of it? Yeah, all of it. Mm -hmm. And then also my career. Like, actually, you know, so there's a point when you're like t to teach camping. You get up to about I was 44, and there's a point when it's like, ah, eh, it's time to move on and time to do something else. And I was clinging yeah. to that. I wanted to work there forever. That was unrealistic. And and so my life changed, my career changed, my output changed. I started writing books. I started a bunch of old friends kind of fell by the wayside. A bunch of wonderful new friends showed up to replace them. So, yeah, everything changed. Everything so changed. I moved. Generally, I moved. it was a, a positive experience. I'm, I, I would not trade the life I have now. Yeah. For the life I had. That's awesome. I'm glad I had that life. Ooh, it was fun. Yeah. But it's I, I I feel like a more mature person. You know what happened? So this is it's between that happened in 2006. In between 2006 and about 2013. That's seven years. I I feel like I spent those seven years obsessively researching mm -hmm. owls. Well, not so much researching. I'd say collecting data. I wasn't so much researching. I was collecting data. And then I feel like I spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane. It wasn't the UFOs. Mm. There was a couple events that were kind of telling, but not many. What was happening is the synchronicities were of such an unrelenting magnitude. It just felt like I couldn't get up in the morning without like some like mind-blowing synchronicity hitting me over the head. And then, and then a bigger, more strange synchronicity would come the next day, and it was, it, my sanity was in jeopardy, and so, like I almost had to go through that, that, like the, like I had to be cracked open, yeah, in order to say, this is real, this is happening, yeah, and boy I did I fight it, wow did I fight it, I was stubborn, yeah I hurt. <laughs> I heard you like to kind of talk about a little bit putting energy into these kind of topics and how that can kind of reciprocate back to your life. And mm. like, how did you kind of regulate that relationship with this kind of topic and these synchronicities that were happening in your life? Well, one was I, I, I formally decided I cannot, I cannot be astonished anymore. Yeah. And that took a long time. That was that was like a seven year process. You know what I did in the early on in this thing? I actually, was having so many owls synchronicity. I was seeing so many owls at a certain point, like 
I lived in a place that right around the Grand Teton National Park. There are a lot of owls. Mm. So, but still, I I went into the woods all alone one day, and I kind of said like, I kind of pointed, I kind of spoke to the universe, and I said, I basically prayed. I said, it's not working. Whatever mm-hmm. you're doing, it's not working. You're hitting me with too many owls. Like an owl <laughs> way over there on the fence. I'm not going to pay attention to that. Owl over there on the <laughs> telephone pole. I'm not paying attention to that. You want to get my attention? I want that owl to cross my path. I want it to be, I don't want some owl off in the distance. I want it to be unmistakable in my face. And then I'll pay attention. Day later, I'm riding my bike down the street. I, as I look up, there's a, owl on a tree and i'm see it on my bicycle this thing like jumps off the tree flies right in front and then lands on the branch on the other side i'm like totally going coasting down the sidewalk i'm not pedaling it's just like and and i was like that happened less than 48 hours after i made my plea to the universe wow power prayer i'm not sure if you if you follow cryptids or not or they pique your interest but oh, yeah. um you know bigfoot is another thing that we we discuss on here i've been very passionate about that trying to understand that rabbit hole but one of the things in in bigfoot um lore um that people um whenever they encounter bigfoot in some cases they hear bigfoot making owl noises and the only way they really know that it's not really an owl is sometimes they will goof up and they'll be making a decent owl noise and all of a sudden it'll just be like super deep or super weird sounding uh it's like they screwed up or it sounds like someone is playing uh an owl an owl sound through a loudspeaker um so they clearly know that anybody who spent time in the woods that that's not a real owl have you ever heard of that or know anybody Mm -hmm. who's ever encountered that i don't know anyone i know some i know a handful of bigfoot researchers and and they I, so, and they'll they'll have owl stories. One owl story I heard from a Bigfoot researcher was, um, they there was a sighting, and they went to the spot in the woods where there was a sighting, and they found this huge like uh, Bigfoot dropping, I guess, big mm-hmm. load of feces, like big Bigfoot poop. Yeah, Bigfoot poop. So they and then in a bag and everything, and this owl was sitting right on a branch nearby watching him the whole time wow and that was like that doesn't happen very often in the woods yeah. i mean it's not uncommon to see an owl yeah but but they're pretty elusive yeah and and i always i always tend to think like i'm not sure if it could be you know a paranormal connection with bigfoot them making owl sounds or is it a convenient way of communicating with each other using natural um owl I mean, sounds in, in the forest, which would be owls. I mean, that's another way of looking at it. It could very well be very be, be that. It's hard to tell, really. I Are they choosing owls for the same reason? So I'm speculating here. So I, I don't know if this is how it works. But are they choosing owls to mimic because the owl is such a highly charged archetype mm-hmm. to, uh, to people? Are they tapping into something on that level? The same way that the yeah. that maybe the UFO occupants are using owls, and choosing them as a screen yeah. memory because of their archetypal power. I would not doubt it because one, um, yeah, I mean, according to some people, people who have had Bigfoot encounters or Bigfoot activity, they have it. They've had other high, things of high strangeness, including orbs. Um, there's countless UFO stories attached to um, mm-hmm. Bigfoot encounters. Um, you know, myself, I've never really encountered a, a Bigfoot before, but I've encountered um, orbs and, and strange, transparent beings in the woods at night um, and and have had some similar bizarre owl um, owls going off shortly after that, which was which was pretty wild. So it's uh, the whole thing is is a rabbit hole all on its own. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, as strange as Bigfoot would be if they are connected to owls in some strange way. Or using it to their advantage. Exactly. That's my sense too. Yeah. That's my sense too, in that they show up in connection with synchronicities. So all of these things are highly charged, right? Bigfoot, you have a Bigfoot encounter, boy, that's mm-hmm. highly charged. So somehow mm-hmm. these highly charged human experiences seem to be tied into to or owls seem to be symbolic of these highly charged mm-hmm. events. Here I'll tell you this is one that has to do with meditation and death. 
So this woman contacts, this is back, I was living with Andrea. This is the, the my partner at the time. We were living in upstate New York and, and we're drinking coffee in front of the fire and, and it's winter time. And a friend of Andrea's emails her and says, is this owl, is this owl seem sick? And I'm sitting right next to her and she shows to me on her phone and she's like, look at this owl. Is this like normal? I look at this thing. Mm. It looks like a normal owl. It's sitting on someone's back porch. I said, what's the story? And it was her friend, Suzanne. And Suzanne said, it's not the Suzanne Chancellor. It's a different Suzanne. Suzanne said, um, I was meditating. I was, it's my, I was, I'm still grieving the death of my mother. And I'm, I was, I, I was meditating. The, the goal of my meditation or the, the, uh, the intention of my meditation that mo this morning, that morning when was to move past the grief, to accept mm -hmm. my mother's death and move past the grief. So she sits in her chair where she meditates and, and then she goes through meditation. Now, now she said like her eyes were closed and when her eyes opened, like if she had been this way or this way, just an inch or so, she would never have seen it, but it was she was totally lined up to a window on the opposite side of the house, like through the kitchen on the other side of the house, and there was this owl looking in at her. And she she got up and she walked to the window and it was this, uh, this owl that she took a picture of and sent to Andrea because Andrea was with, she, they knew that she knew that I was there, then I could like answer an owl question. And I was like, wait a minute, you're, 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 you meditated with the intention of moving past the grief of your mom's? And she said, yeah. She said, and I said, this, and the reason I said this, what I said next is because of so many accounts I heard. I said, you open that window and you talk to that owl as if it is your mom. Mm. And she did. She opened the window and she had this long mm -hmm. conversation. It was one side that she was talking to the owl. The owl eventually flew off and it was in a tree, but still looked in, was still in the yard and was there all day. Mm -hmm. She had a long talk and, and, she just basically said, Mom, I miss you. Thank you for all the hard work. That was her mother's birthday. Wow. That happened the day of her mother's birthday. Wow. And and my question, what was going on before? What was going on after? I basically said, how are you doing? I called her. I checked in over the next few days. How are you doing? And she said, you know, it was a really powerful experience. I feel so much better now. Mm. So before the owl said, no, no UFO in this story. Right. Before the, the owl sighting she was she had the intention of moving beyond the grief and she used meditation as like a tool after the owl sighting she felt like her grief had been lifted i got whoa, i got that story just whoa, I got to, that story all over the place just to piggyback off of that real quick have and i'm hoping you've seen this, this is an incredible video there's a video that i've seen on social media where uh there is a granddaughter mm -hmm. And a grandmother and this this owl, she looks like a great horned owl, has, was showing up on their second or third story um, patio. Mm -hmm. And this owl would show up and whenever the grandmother would come outside, it would start getting excited. And they believed that they truly felt that that was... Um, her her late husband who just passed away. His grandpa, yeah. Those it was unbelievable, uh, unbelievable, incredible video. If you anybody listening to this has not seen it, just Google it, look it up. It is an absolutely mind blowing video. I'm convinced that owls showed up like that outside mm. the cave, outside the teepee, outside the mud hut, right? That's like I'm convinced. I can't mm. prove it, but for me, in my soul let's say i'm convinced mm. that that is a universal story all throughout human history they say it straight up the granddaughter mm. says that it's grandpa and the and owl is like, the owl's excited the moment yeah. the moment she walks out and you the, see the owl just perking up i mean this is I a think, wild owl this is not somebody's pet then the 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 uh i think the grandmother was 100 years old i think that's yeah what, or I mean, she was close to 100 she might, I think she would. And yes, super heartwarming. Unbelievable. Absolutely unflinching. Mm -hmm. The daughter doesn't, the granddaughter doesn't say, we think this is grandpa. No, they, they say, knew. They say, this is they grandpa. Knew. And this owl is only feet away from them. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. you do not have a wild owl show up day after day. And it wasn't showing up every single day. I think it showed up a, a variety of different times. But that the possibility of something like that happening 
I mean, you probably have better chances of winning the lottery two or three times. Mm-hmm. So, so here's another story that says there's no UFO in this story. This, this reporter gets a hold of me, and she says, "I, I couldn't. I, there was a uh, civic leader in this town, in a big town. I don't want like a big city. Everyone, in, you, I don't want to give the name of the town, but um, and then they, the civic leader." had died and they were having a public memorial at the in the park in the middle of town and it's at nighttime and this barn owl lands on a lamppost and everyone nobody had to explain it to him nobody had to organize it everyone just stood in line and waited in line facing the lamppost and the first person in line would look up at the owl i'm just gonna I, i'm gonna let's just say the guy's name was john yeah. And they say, John, you're, um, you're a great friend. I'm so honored to have known you. It's just like it's a really it's a joy that we could share those all these years together. Thank you so much for being my friend. And he would step aside. The next person would just talk to this owl. The owl sat and waited till everyone talked and then flew off. Wow. Those experiences could be so helpful for people, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Remarkably healing. Remarkably healing. I, I'm just like, oh, I, I mean, I got stories where like, the, somebody's dad dies, dies of a heart attack. Man, the hospital, he's dead on arrival mm-hmm. at the hospital. He he walks out of the hospital that night. The little the sliding doors open up. There's an owl standing on the sidewalk facing him. Mm-hmm. And he stands there and says, Dad, you're a great dad. Thank you for all, all you did. I, it's just, it's, I, I'm convinced it's universal. It's a yeah. universal experience, and it's not. And there's other birds too. I've heard robins and hummingbirds yeah. and sparrows and stuff like that. But I was right after them. right after my my partner's um, uh, mother died. Um, she went to a, a psychic shortly after, and the psychic said that your mother appears as an osprey. Um, that she that's that's the form that she would visit her in. So I found that to be very profound as well. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So it's, I, I'm just, I think, so I have to, I know I live in this material world of Western, of us, like of uh, people who are like, I know to go to elementary school and public school and what I was taught and what my parents thought and everything like that. But at the same time, I know what I've been studying and I see the patterns. And so I have to be, people will say like, oh, this weird thing happened. And they'll tell a story just like this. And I'll say, that's not weird. That, in my opinion, is a normal human experience. That's normal. Mm-hmm. So what you've experienced is not unusual. It is part of of what it means to be alive and what it means to be a, a an aware human. Yeah, you nailed it with that. It is definitely an awareness thing, for sure. It really opens your eyes. Yeah, and that spiritual aspect of it is really interesting, too. Kind of, It seems like the stories all kind of have some aspect of it but well that's um, the spiritual aspect is something that that um so mufon you're familiar with mufon the organization mufon mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. They, someone like i like they hand i said i kind of was like hey can you give me like i talked to a guy i know a guy who works for mufon i'm not gonna say his name can you give me one of those files one of those forms they have a form <laughs> that you know, like they're kind of you know like they're mufon's funny they're kind of like you know, like, oh, we can't share that. So I got one. I got Very one of the serious. Forms. I got one of the forms where, the, so if you go to the house, right? So someone sees a UFO, you show up at their door, you knock on their door, you fill out the form, you say, what date was it? The really pragmatic, normal stuff. What was the date? About what time it was? Which way did it fly? Could you draw a picture of it? Very simple, straight questions that, that they correctly should answer. You get a little farther down, it says, has your spirituality changed? Mm-hmm. Has your religion changed? Do you now have psychic abilities? Mm-hmm. That's on that list. Yeah. So the most conservative of 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 organizations mm-hmm. is correctly asking these questions. Now I know why they're asking it because these guys have been doing this research since like nineteen whatever the organization's been around since the late sixties, and they must have seen a pattern where people have you yeah. Know. Mm-hmm. So so here's a weird thing. Okay. So so I have a clipboard. Here, here's my clipboard. This is on my desk. It's here all the time. And then I talk to people on the phone, and I have my clipboard and my pencil, and I make notes. So when I talk to people with their all-in-UFO experience, I don't write much down. I write their phone number down on the date and a few key things. So if 
they were called back and refer to that piece of paper. I write in the corner of that paper Reiki. Do you know what Reiki healing is? Yes. I've heard about it. Can you what is it exactly? Reiki healing is 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 a is an ancient form of Japanese, like Zen Japanese. Hand, it's hands off, mm -hmm. so you don't nobody. It's not laying out of hands, but it's hands off. Okay. Of of energy healing, mm -hmm. and and there's remarkable stories about people having. I would to, to you know I'm sure there's some uh, some but people. You know, if they have tension or back aches or or issues, they can go to a Reiki therapist. Mm -hmm. They just lay on a meditation table and the Reiki therapist does nothing except move their hands over. They're going through a set of intentions or, or let's say a ritual set of intentions in their mind. And and then they seem to be able to project healing energy through their hands. And this is, there's like just any town is going to have some Reiki therapists in the town. Yeah. So I write Reiki in the corner of the page. When I talk to these people... It, I just wait. I just wait. You know, they tell me their story with the UFO and the owl, and then I, mm. and then I just like kind of at the owl. What do you do for What do you do for work? And they say, oh, "I'm a Reiki healer." Mm. Wow. Now it's not everyone, obviously, but I would mm. argue that fifty percent, half of the people who have UFO and owl experiences, are also doing Reiki healing. If it's mm -hmm. not Reiki healing, it's some similar yeah. modality of of energy healing. That me is an outrageous i mean i don't know yeah. what to think of that it's That's it's ex extremely profound but I, I, it, it does seem that anybody who's had ufo and experiences paranormal experiences in general there's no way that you're not unscathed in some shape or form it's i do believe that it changes you it changes your your consciousness. I feel like it it enlightens you to a degree where it's more of a of a growth, and it give it it just opens the doorways where you're allowing more information to flow in, and it it, it changes how you view reality. And I think once you have that that idea in your head that there's something else out there different that is possible. I think it mm -hmm. just allows more information to come into you for you to be able to process. And then that is almost like a contagion all in itself where it just it just keeps growing, where you, you're, you're more open to receive information from the universe. You're more open to to um, embrace your own consciousness. Um, I, I think that's it just it leaves everybody impacted in some shape or form, um, no matter yeah. what. Your, you your think... definition of reality is instantaneously Absolutely. altered. So, so, so when that happens, there's like there's a crisis that takes place, right? So you're like we we like having our knowledge of reality, right? Like this is reality. Yeah. This is how it all works. Boy, yeah. someone sees a flying saucer land in their backyard. Whoosh, that's, that's out it. the window instantly. Yep. They got a they got that something crumbles. Something has to be rebuilt. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you think the those kind of people or that work in that kind of field do have those um, sightings more or have these uh, events happen to them? I, I'm going to use a, I'm going to use a kind of a, you know, like Gary Larson cartoons, the far side, this is sort of a far side cartoon concept yeah. of how it may, this is how it feels. I'm not saying it works this way, but this is how it feels. It feels like these UFO f occupants are flying around their flying saucer. They're looking down at us and they're saying like, wow, these people are messed up. They need, so they kind of like go through the checklist. What do they need? And like, oh, it's like, you know what they, you know what would help them? They need more Reiki healers. And they just, I feel like they're just seeding the population with Reiki healers. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I'm, I may be wrong. I like yeah. that because it's, it's a playful it's, it way to express sure it. Sure sounds great. But I, but I don't know if it really works that way, but that's what it feels like. So you're so, trying to say that they kind of emphasize the importance of that. It sure seems that way. Yeah. Hmm. So and if it's I, not Reiki healing, it's some other modality or some yeah. other thing. So, I, I got a, I got a two part. Oh no, absolutely, please. We well, have a two. Go ahead, ask the question. I'll come back to it. So. Um, were, the first question is: Were you were you the first person who really kind of connected these dots? Were there other people that were paying attention to this and 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 doing some type of work with it? And then my second my second question is: You know, this has really led you down a road of of being able to create relationships with some some very credible people in in this ufo world in this paranormal world um 
if you don't mind, you could also talk about some of these relationships that you've created with some of these people um, and how, you know, a lot of times this has been some personal encounters for them. Like, for example, even the Chris Bledsoe story, I was mm -hmm. reading his book. And as soon as I'm rolling through the pages, all oh, of a sudden Owl's he's having it. a he's having Owl's a crazy it. owl story. So, you know, kind of talk about that, if you don't mind, of like how, these these relationships that you've been able to develop with these people. And how, you know, they've they've interpreted that as well with these owl encounters. So here, let me just do something here. So here's 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 the, my books. These are my th owl books. So there's three owl books and you stack them up. It's it's right. Almost a thousand. It's like close to a mm. thousand pages right on the button of a thousand pages. So people contact me and they say, Mike, Kate, can you I, do, do you have enough material for another book? I'm like, I can buy enough material for 50 more books. Yeah. It would all be the same story. It would be the same story over and over and over. Yeah. I couldn't tell it in a thousand pages. Like, it can't be told. So mm. so you asked, um, was I the first person? No, I was not. So uh, Whitley Strieber very mm -hmm. beautifully wrote about it. And yeah. you know what I did I, recently? This is just a couple years ago. I went through and I got all his books on Kindle. They were, he had some sale and they were all cheap. So I had mm -hmm. some of them and I got them all on Kindle and I just searched all of them for the word owl, Whitley Strieber's books. He's written a lot of books. <laughs> so yeah. and I searched the word owl and then there was stuff, there were books that I had read before I got into this owl thing. And they, they he spelled, he's a beautiful writer. He spells it out succinctly, gets right to the point, talks about the, the mystical connection between UFO contact and owls beautifully does it beautifully it could i i printed it out it's like four pages he said everything i've said in a thousand pages he said it in four mm -hmm. and well, that's i'm being a little bit so so but what i did when i can say I, what, what I, certainly i did was i i went obsessively crazy <laughs> i like yeah. i was threw myself into it and said right and part of the reason was is that so the owl is one, I keep on doing this thing. Here's the big thing, here's the little little thread, and I just pulled on that little thread of owls. Mm -hmm. Here's this UFO subject. Let me just let me just pull that little thread of owls and see what appears. And every time I'd pull it, it would be like, wow, that is a beautiful story. Like, oh, this has got a mystique to it. What I can say is that the owl and UFO in connection, the stories that are emerging are exactly the kind of I almost want to use the term campfire story. You know yeah. what that means? That just yeah. implies, yeah. oh, it's a campfire story. It's just spooky enough. And and so I I was always drawn to those stories. Now I'm 60 years old, and I just open my email inbox every morning, and I just I'm just get I get a bunch of them, and I feel in I feel really fortunate. So I would drop this instantly if it if it didn't prove fruitful. It's continually fruitful, the owl thing. You asked one more question in that, and it was... Um... It, it was, you know, being that you're in this line of work, obviously there yeah, yeah, yeah. there's these major, you know, UFO characters um, that, that have had owl encounters. How have you been able to develop the relationships with these people, um, and where is it taking you? Being able to network with these people and even kind of dive deeper into it. Well, Chris Bledsoe is a perfect example. Yeah, Chris, where are you are you in? The, you're in the South. Are you, I yeah, can't Florida. Yeah. Okay, Florida, Florida. So he's in North Carolina. So, mm -hmm. so my sister lives in North Carolina. I, my mother was at a uh, assisted living facility in North Carolina. So I was in North Carolina a lot as my mother was. She eventually succumbed to Alzheimer's. But I'm sorry to hear that. It was terrible. It was uh, that's that happened in a decade ago. It was 2013, ten years ago, in July. So. But I just was there one time, and I had been doing, I'd already, at that point, I was already collecting owl stories, lots of them. And I just, I had heard a podcast with Chris Bledsoe, mm -hmm. and I was just, I called him up, just looked up his name in the phone book, called him up. Like, Chris, my name is Mike Clellan. I lived, I'm in Charlotte right now. Uh, can I come and visit you? He said, you just come on over. S -s Calm, sweetest guy. He <laughs> invited me in. He's like, everyone says it. Like, when they say, like, oh, I met Chris. Chris is a total genuine, yeah. big-hearted, wow. Like, like he's like, he's got a special energy. So I just showed up at his house, and he didn't know who I was. He had no idea who I was. And he took me into his back room. He said, like, when I, this is a, this is, 
he talks about this in the book, but he, mm-hmm. he did, had no idea. I was in his house for one minute. Bedroom. He said, this is where I hung out. I had all these issues with like, well, when I saw all this stuff first started happening, he speaks very slowly. When all this stuff started happening, I did not know what to do. I just, I locked myself away in this room. So mm-hmm. it's a room in the corner, back corner of the house. And then there was a window. There's mm-hmm. a couple windows, but he pointed to this one window and there was a bush there. He said, that bush, see that bush there? I was, I just locked myself away here for a year. See that bush there? These two owls would sit there in that bush and looking at me the whole time mm. I was in here. I'm like, wow. You didn't, like, do you know who I am? Like, <laughs> like that was like a minute into our conversation. Yeah. And, and I was just like, did he know that you were? He did an after owl I, guy? I told him. Oh yeah, he he found out after, but he didn't. He had no. But idea. He had no idea ahead of time. No wow. idea. That's incredible. So, but but that's that's like this kind of highly charged yeah. synchronous. I keep on like, like if I, like if some of these things were written out, I keep on thinking. I I I love movies and stuff like that, and I keep mm-hmm. on thinking like if this was a movie, and I wrote it out exactly the way it played out, right? And I'm in the script writing room. And I write this thing out and I hand the script to the executive producer. The executive producer would have every right to come in and go like, <laughs> like it's too much. It's over the top. Like bring yeah. it down a little bit. It's unbelievable. So like real life is like more weird right. than fiction. It really is. Like if I was writing for the X-Files, like, you know, the, the executive producer of the X-Files would have to, he, he would have every right to come in the room. Yeah. And if, if I told my story, he, if I told my story as a script, He'd say, uh, it's too much. And I think that is true of, that's certainly true of Chris Bledsoe. Yeah. It's certainly true of Suzanne Chancellor. Mm-hmm. It's certainly true of, I could list a long list of people who the real life events are so overwhelming. Yeah. Whitley Strieber, wow. I'm not alone in this. And, and, and that's been, so when people contact me here, I'm just gonna, this is like, there's very little I can say, right? I can't say like, oh, you know, I, I understand you're stressed out and here's some therapy. I can't do that. Like that's, that would be unconscionable. What I, all I can do is listen. And then the people will say, have you ever heard this before? And I, and I, oftentimes I can say, I have not heard that exact same story before. Mm-hmm. But what I can say is I have heard the same story, same flavor and mood. And and that so you are not alone and that yeah. that has been that alone if that's pretty much all i do that's all i can offer and that yeah. has been so helpful for people and that I've, i say that because they get back to me later and said oh when you yeah. told me that that was so helpful yeah. um uh it's the mere fact that when you're living with something that is that profound whatever that experience may be of high strangeness it, you're almost a tortured soul until you realize that someone else out there in the world has has experienced something similar mm-hmm. to you. And when you hear a story, or even better, you start hearing multiple stories, a lot of stories that are very similar to what you've experienced. It is this, there's this huge weight that is lifted off of you. And then it transforms you into, that actually happened and it, I think it really drives your curiosity of wanting to explore even further because you're, you, you have this acknowledgement of like, hey, this actually did happen. There's other people out here that are experiencing something similar to what I have. It, it's just such a, an amazing feeling whenever something like that happens. So you, so you wouldn't really recommend someone who's had these experiences to, to do therapy or like hypnosis or anything like that? Oh, I certainly would recommend therapy. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, but you also have to have a therapist that's going to be open to this. I got a story. I wrote about it in one of my books. It was like, I basically, there was a, like, it was hard. Like, wow, it was hard. And at the same time, I felt like I was a very grounded person. I was responsible. I had a job. And I was like, I was like, you know, like, I, but it was, wow, was I stressed. I went to a therapist and it was pretty, there was like a thing in the in this town where they had a, there was actually, this is, this was, there was events where um, there were rash of suicides in the town, and so wow. they they were they were it was all young adults. So, but there was a they were offering the town itself paid for a few office visits. 
So you can just yeah. have a free office visit. And so I was like, great. I'm, let me just see how this, like, I'm going to see what this therapist is like. So I went into this therapist and I went in there and I said, like, okay, here's my issue. I've got these issues. And they were all the kind of things you would expect, you know, expect from someone who'd been stressed out, you know, anxieties and insecurities and, and when, you know, and like part of it is I, I feel like I've been abducted by aliens. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I didn't, I didn't laugh when I said it. I feel like I made my case very logically right. and here's my memories and here's what I'm, and whoa, that didn't go over very well. She, I really? went back the next week. I went back the next week and she, this lady was like, um, have you ever considered taking antipsychotic medication? Oh, oh, no. I no. have not considered that and I won't be taking yeah. antipsychotic medication. Not against therapist. Thanks. Thanks. I'm I won't like, be doing thanks that. Thanks for the visit. I'm leaving kind yeah. of thing. So, yeah. Um, but it was, um, so that, so I, boy, you got to get a sensitive therapist and they're out there. Yeah. They're yeah, out they there. And then hypnosis, I've had hypnosis sessions. I can talk about it if you want. Yeah, sure. And please, please. Yeah, that'd be great. I, so I'm, I gotta, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm in a funny place where I just like, I just like dreams, like, oh, someone has a, like a, you, an owl experience where they see some owl on a lunchbox. That counts for me. Right, so someone walks by in an owl T-shirt at just the right moment. That's just as important as a real owl to me. So I'm I'm pretty much open to this kind of symbolic storytelling mode of these things. So, like I had an experience under hypnosis uh, that was super complicated, goes on and on and on. But but I would it involved me like oh. it involved an event that had no fear associated with the event where I was sleeping outside under the stars. Yeah. And I saw what looked like a round building on a hill. This is in southern Utah. And and I was just traveling and I was just that's in the west it's very common just to pull off on the side of the road and 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 just find a nice spot to sleep and no one no one hassles you. Yeah. Around. It's just so so I slept on the side of the road and I saw this round building and I said that looks just like a landed flying saucer. <laughs> and then and then I, a couple other things happened. There was a bright light behind a bush later that same night. And there was, yeah. a, there was a, here's a weird thing. There was a coyote howling near my head. Whoa. I couldn't see it. Didn't make any sense. Like, like I, I worked out doing outdoor work. I've slept outside a lot. I've heard a lot of coyotes. Yeah. This was as close as I've ever heard. I couldn't see it. I didn't understand. I sat up. I looked around. Where is this thing? In retrospect, I cautiously say this. That feels like like an audio screen memory. Like, okay. I don't think there was a real coyote there. I think it was some sort of symbolic element. Now the coyote is symbolic, in, especially in Southern Utah, the lore of the trickster. So Definitely. The, yeah, so was the trickster is part of an initiation, right? You wanna have something, where the, the role of the trickster in certain traditions is that, so you don't take yourself too seriously. That's the court jester in, mm -hmm. in the, with the king. Like you don't take yourself. This is there's got to be some level of absurdity to this because if you take it too seriously, you're it's it's not serving you. So. So anyway, so I. I had a hypnosis session of that night, and. So, oh, was it unbelievable? Like I really am cautious to trust it, and I was like swearing and screaming at these beings if it was if it was to be taken seriously, and I don't know whether it happened or whether it didn't happen or not but wow is it an interesting story so i can i can i'm open that maybe it happened yeah just the way i perceived it but there's some elements in it that don't make any sense at all for instance i was i so here let me just tell you so i'm dancing around it yeah so I'm about little, to say, please, take a, please just go into it because yeah, <laughs> so 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 i'm gonna beforehand let me just one more time like yeah yeah i don't know if this happened you'll understand my hesitance when i tell the story so I'm okay. I'm I'm like the hypno hypnotherapist is this woman Yvonne Smith. She's a wonderful, big hearted woman. And she and before we went under, this was in two thousand and eighteen. So that's five years ago. So mm -hmm. before I went under, we sit in the office, we talk about things, and so let's talk about this night. There's no fear associated with this night. She's like, Great. And then I said, Hey, while I'm under, you ask me what's up with the owls. Can you do that? And she said, Sure, I'm happy to do that. Great. So she takes me back to that night and it's a simple induction the induction is not much more than like okay you're walking down some stairs every step is you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and it's just a simple visualization thing it doesn't okay. feel like anything at all it feels like i'm just like dude you're like sitting on our couch mm -hmm. 
like I, actually i'm laying on her couch i was too funny i was too tall and i had to like move a table and kind of put my feet out and so i'm kind of crooked on the couch and my feet are off to the side and, and she's like um it doesn't feel like anything it doesn't feel like anything it feels like totally like normal like like she could have like talked about anything and i would have just been laying there like okay and then she says um let's go back to that night and what's happening and like um uh, I'm sitting there and it's pretty night. There's lots of stars and I got a big pillow and I got my big warm sleeping bag and I'm sleeping next to my car and it's and there's this building. I think it's a building on the hill. Yeah. And then and then I talk about and then the I talk about the light behind the bush. And all of a sudden my voice totally changes. It's really spooky when you hear it. <laughs> hear me to I have the audio recording of it. I've transcribed it. And I go, wow. I know it's them. I know it's them. I know it's them. I say it's so like I'm like oh God, it's them. They're behind the bush. Wow. And then the next thing is, I'm like looking down at this big round building, which I'm assuming I'm just. I said it first thing out of my mind when I was conscious. I said this looks like a flying saucer, a landed flying yeah. saucer. So I'm looking down at this thing. It's black. Mm -hmm. It's got a ring of lights around the outside. I think it's black just because it's nighttime. There's nothing to see really. It's just mm -hmm. but and and there's a ring of lights around it. And I go, I'm above this thing. I'm, I'm floating above this. What, like, and and I, 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 I think I'm still in the sleeping bag. And she goes, Mike, are you out of body? I'm like, I don't know. I'm looking down at this thing. I'm still mm. in the sleeping bag. And then the next thing, I'm just, whoosh, I'm like, I'm like inside, and I'm walking down this hall. My very first thought was like, I'm not tall. I'm not Wait a minute, tall. you're you're inside the craft. I'm inside this thing. I'm walking down wow. a hallway. This hallway like is curving, right? So it's like mm -hmm. it's like being inside a donut, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. so like a big round hallway. Then it feels like I could just walk all the way around and come right back to the same point. Wow. And I'm I'm walking down this hallway, and I'm I know just what it means to be six foot tall, and I'm like I'm not tall. And I look oh, to wow. my left, and I look to my right, and there's these little beings like with the bald heads and the big black eyes. Yeah. Gosh. And I, this is like, and and I'm, and it feels, and I'm like, I, I'm not tall. And she says, "Look at your body. Look down at yourself." And I and I looked down at my hands, and I got these long, 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 skinny fingers, and I'm wearing this tight, like shiny space suit. I'm super skinny, and I oh say, "I think I'm a gray alien." Wow. She doesn't skip a beat. Doesn't she? Doesn't phase her at all. She goes, "And what happens next?" And I said, "This feels totally normal." This feels totally mm. normal. Why well, I'm a gray alien. And then the next thing that happens is I whoosh, like I'm on, I'm in this conference room and it's like imagine like the ugliest conference room in like some crappy hotel in Muncie, Indiana, right? So it's yeah. got like whoosh, ugly carpeting, beige carpeting and and you know, like mismatched paneling and there's folding chairs and a folding table and it's got fluorescent lights. It's like doesn't it's like do you know when Saturday night live when they have a set? Yeah. Mm. You know, when it's mm -hmm. got three sides, it's got a back mm -hmm. wall and two side walls. It's called a three sided set. That's what it felt like. It felt like it's the cheapest set. It felt like it was so three sided. Weird. I only, I could never look out one direction. And and it was like, this is like, when I'm, I'm in a conference room. So, and I was facing this table. It felt like I was in a, like a tribunal, right? Like I was on trial or oh. I was like at the grand jury hearing. And I'm standing in front of yeah. these beings. I can't quite see them, they, but I would say there's a big, there's a bunch of gray aliens sitting at a folding table in a mm. conference room. Like, I don't think there's a conference room on a flying saucer. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, so I'm like, she's like, what happens? And I'm like, I, I, I ask them, like, why am I here? And they go, you volunteered for this. Hmm. Like, volunteered for what? I, what are you talking about? I volunteered for this. And they go, now is the time. Now is the time. That's just what are you talking about? Now is the time. Did you volunteered for this? And it goes back and forth. And all of a sudden, I like get this like flash of knowing, and mm. I chewed them out. I got so angry. I was like, I was, I was like, you don't understand loneliness. You don't understand sadness. You don't understand fears. Like you don't understand. And they just wow. said, you volunteered for this. And the implication is that I had at one point been one of those beings, mm -hmm. and now I had incarnated into Earth, and I had like this that memory is right. I don't know it's locked away it's gone yeah and and that I 
and then I had volunteered to play some role. And wow, wow. did I was freaking swearing at him, oh, and I was man. crying, and like, poor That's Yvonne was duty. like, Mike, Mike, you're like, like, why are you so emotional? And I'm like, they want me to play mm-hmm. some role. This is like, and I just, yeah. and, and I just went, and then all of a sudden, I was like, whoosh. Yeah. And I just, I was like, totally calm. I'd just been like freaking out, and I was yeah. totally yeah. calm. And then I, and Yvonne said, what what's where are you now? what's happening and i said i i'm back in the sleeping bag so we talk a little bit and she said what did they want and i said i don't know i said you can tell me mike you can tell me i said i don't know and i said you know what it felt like i said you know in a spy movie when a spy is holding an envelope he's got to deliver he's got to hold on to that but he can't open the envelope yet like i yeah. feel like i'm holding the envelope i'm not allowed to open it that's what it felt like and then we're, like it's kind of winding down and i'm like wow that was wow that was weird you know and <laughs> and uh, and then and then she said and mike what is your connection to owls now this is 2018 i'd been 10 years mm-hmm. morning noon and night owls 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 answering owl emails writing owl books talking about owls going to conferences about owls uh, that's and all i she- did did she job. know your connection with oh, Alice yeah, yeah. at the time? Had, she, knew, okay. she, knew, okay. she had my book, yeah. So. Okay. I was <laughs> so, like, what are the chances? <laughs> I know, no, no, right? but I asked her ahead of time to ask I wouldn't her. be shocked, but... I asked her, I totally said to her, you ask me about the owls when I'm under. Oh, okay. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. So I, Did I say that earlier? I hope I did. I think... Anyways, I so I put I don't her, think I, so. Okay, so forgive me. Let's back up. <laughs> Before I went under, I told her, ask me what my connection to owls yeah. is. Okay. And then, so at the very end, she says, and Mike, what is your connection to owls? And I say, here's what I said. And this is weird because this, like you can hear my voice doesn't sound the same. I mean, it's my voice, obviously. Mm-hmm. She says, what is your connection to owls? I say, the owls aren't important. Like I had been morning, noon, and night, owls. That's all mm-hmm. I cared about. Answer phone calls, answer emails, owls, owls, owls. I say the owls aren't important, which I never would have said. And then I can just I can just do this right off. It's like not much, but let me just roll right through it. I said, the owls aren't important. I am an artist and I know what it means to speak in symbols. The mm. owls aren't important. The owl is a sign on a door. Mm. The owl is the correct symbol for the door, but the owl is not important. We are on this side of the door Mm -hmm. in a tight, claustrophobic little hallway. And on the opposite side of the door is an infinite vastness. Wow. Wow. And I don't know where that came from. (laughs) So, so, so let's like, then I get up and then I have to like, okay, bye. And then I have to like, mm-hmm. like standing there in the parking lot, like, okay, great. Now, like what just happened? So like, there's no conference room with shag carpeting on a flying saucer. Yeah. Pretty sure. Like I, I don't know. So I don't believe it literally, right? It's a great but- story. It's a yeah. great story. I don't. I don't Maybe I'm it's just it. nothing but symbolism. Yeah, about to say the symbolity. It's or, symbol- yeah, yeah, sure. As it's a dream, right? So a yeah. dream can you can get a lot of information in a dream. Dreams are in symbolic. Now, let's let's so the so that happened. The event, the, so the hypnosis took place in 2018 in August of 2018. The actual event was March 10th, 2013. Okay. That's when I was sleeping on the side of the road. I came home. I I had a bunch of I had a bunch of like it was a weird a couple of days after that was wild for me. And I at the end of like I basically had an awakening experience and was like mm. like this is real. It was after that and 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 I had so f- forty eight hours after the night where I slept under the stars and said. That looks just like a landing flying saucer. 48 hours later, I started writing the first book, The Messengers. Wow. I didn't realize that at the time. It it took me years Mm -hmm. to figure that out. Wait a minute. I started writing the book. I started writing the book less than 48 hours after that night under the stars. And if the story is to be believed under hypnosis, I was told the events of March 10th, 2013, and I basically screamed, you know, poor Yvonne was like, Mike, why are you so emotional? And I was like, they want me to play some role. 
So did I do their bidding and write this book? Mm, yeah. Wow. Because can I'm, we kind of unpack I'm, that experience real quick? Just kind of like oh, go your ahead, personal. Please, please. So I mean, like first off, let's kind of just um, have like you kind of explained in there that you feel like you had an out of body experience in the beginning of it, correct? Mm -hmm. Have you had an, an experience like that afterwards, or is that yep. your only time ever having? Well, one? it was that was only hip, under hypnosis. So I'm I'm like, it's it's in your mind. Like, it's just like I'm lying on a couch. She's asking me yeah. questions. Like I'm not experiencing it. You know what it felt like? It felt like I was. Say, she would ask me questions. Words would come out of my mouth. I couldn't like oh, okay. the words would come out, and then I would get these kind of flashes, visuals like click click, like like hmm. it, think hmm. of a slideshow. Someone like. Shows you the slide and clicks it right off. Yep. So I just get this little click, click, oh, conference room. Like click, click, oh, hallway. You know, click, click. Oh. So so it, so it was not like reliving a dream. It was not like reliving a memory. But it was. Okay. And then, um, well, your other question was. Um, oh, well, I mean, I just kind of want to unpack the whole thing. But, um, I, uh, oh, well, to finish what I was saying before was, have you had an out-of-body experience prior or after that experience. So, so that was your only time kind of feeling like you had something and I, and similar. I, and I've talked to a lot of people who've had out of body experiences. I've talked to a lot of people who have had near death experiences. So I'm well versed in that, but I've never mm -hmm. experienced that. Here's something weird. So so my brother asked me this because he like he came to a UFO conference and saw me talk. I stood on my stage and my older brother is in the audience and I'm like, oh God, what am I getting? So, <laughs> so he, he saw me and afterwards he said, Wait, were you really on that? Do you feel you were really on that flying saucer? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, so when I sleep outside, so I would did a lot of outdoor work. This is so your hands get cold or my hands get cold, right? So I yeah. keep a pair of thick gloves. They're just like gloves you'd get at the outdoor store, thick full gloves. And, mm -hmm. and, and I keep them in a pocket or it's actually, I don't put them in a pocket. So I, I have a big thick jacket on. It was cold. This was March in, in, so it was like winter camping. There's no snow anywhere, but it was like winter camping. And so I, I open my jacket and I set them like right in the little fold where your arm is. And then you just sleep like that. And they're there all night. So if I need my gloves, I don't have to undo a zipper. I don't have to find them. I know right where they are. I just pull them out and I put them on my hands. I've done this a hundred times, many hundreds of times sleeping out. I remember getting up that morning. And that wasn't the first thing that I checked. It was like, like I, I had no memory of that event on the flying saucer, if that's what had happened. Yeah, I have no memory of that, but I knew something when I went down that night. So when I woke up that morning, I was like, "Ooh!" Like, did it? and I remember standing up, and I opened, and the the gloves were right there. Now, if I had been taken out and like kind of like marched into a through a door into a flying saucer, yeah. like those would have fallen out. So I was right that morning. I was like hyper aware, like like I never left the sleeping bag. My physical hmm. body never left the sleeping bag. Mm. I feel very strongly saying that. So. I've never, I, I can follow the logic, the story logic. I can follow that and say, yes, I, I could very well have had an out-of-body experience induced by these beings. I was taken on board this craft. You know, I talked about it with Yvonne afterwards, and I said, you know what it felt like? It felt like there was a rubber suit, like a gray alien rubber suit, like a costume yeah. waiting for me. Mm. And I just like went, whoosh, my my non-physical like a like an identity. avatar exactly and i just so went you... right into it and then was walking down the hall that's what it felt like wow. doesn't make it true yeah. but that's what it felt like yeah. so do you, do you think that the these entities like the grays for example like do you feel like they're like a vessel for like the human soul or like our consciousness Ooh. or was that like experience just like a totally new thing for you like oh it was totally new for me like wow, totally okay, so new for me. Yeah, yeah. So you never but I've had certainly any like read thoughts things. Of... I've certainly okay. read things. I've talked to people, and it seems like this is one thing that I've heard this from a number of experiencers, where they say the gray be and this is just something that that feels right. Again, doesn't make mm -hmm. it right, but it feels like that wherever they are, wherever these beings live, they live in a realm of like let's say pure energy where they don't have like yeah. a physical body the way we understand a physical body these gray beings are an in between they are a useful avatar where mm -hmm. they can enter this 
rubber suit or mm -hmm. biological suit or whatever you want to call it, and that they can then enter our reality, our physical reality with time and dimensions and, mm -hmm. and sounds. And, and so that's what I've heard. That has the ring of truth to it to me. Yeah, that doesn't make I, it real, I, but that has the ring of truth to it. I've I've always felt something similar to that to that theory, that they're experiencing through us. I, I mean, I, I know that this doesn't really go with what you're saying, but it's kind of similar to like uh, some of the thoughts that Scientologists have. Uh, I don't know if you've ever like very little followed it. Yeah, they kind of. I mean, I I don't really know a lot about it, but I've heard that they kind of believe that these entities like came here from like a long time ago and like their souls formed into us or something mm -hmm. along that line and they're kind of like us as humans are we're, we're living this life kind of I don't, I don't really know how to put it but like they're living in us their their presence and then when we die like they're, they transcend or whatever. It's kind of, mm -hmm. it's kind of an odd thing. It, it's kind of similar to that, uh, an aspect to that story you said, but like, do you, did you feel that that's what they wanted? Cause you, they said you, that you volunteered. Do you feel like they, they want to experience what we're having here on earth? Like the, think, the feelings and the emotions no, or even having the soul they, experience. They yeah. wanted me, so the implication is, doesn't make it true. Again, I'm going to back up. I'm like, I'm really cautious because I'm really worried that people will watch this and said, Mike Clellan thinks he was abducted by aliens and they like, you know, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I'm like, yeah. I'm saying that it was. Yeah, I understand so that. It's, a, right. it's more elusive than that. And so what it feels like is like I was commanded to write a book. That's what I was going to get into with you. Yeah. I mean, you have yeah. to. Do you do you feel? I mean, you could you pretty much just answered it, but with all these things that you've that you've experienced and had in your life and connecting these dots, do you feel like this was something that you were set out to do? Like this is almost your mission in life is to is to carve out this path, so to speak. I can certainly entertain that idea. You know, I, like I look just like my dad. You know, look like my brother. Like I'm I'm me. Like I'm a physical me, like I'm here, I'm from earth. I love earth, right? I love sleeping out. I love the smell of fall leaves and I'm, I'm from earth, you know? So I'm, that's never been in doubt. Yeah. So is it a metaphor? Is it a story? Is it, is it some fantastical thing for me to, to just to contemplate? Like I can contemplate it and wrap my sure. mind around it, but Absolutely. wow, like then I have to like do this normal mundane things and i you know like oh i can go for a walk in the mm -hmm. forest and it's beautiful and i can just get totally immersed and lost in that and so wow is that a tough one here let me tell of one funny story this is a story i love yes. so much this this woman had an experience she said, sure she had missing time she was driving her car she was like felt like she was had this missing time event like all of a sudden she was back in her car and she was totally someplace somewhere else she's like behind a gravel pit you know, so she's like, where am I? Like she was on a highway in New York state. Like she was on the New York state throughway and she had to like come back. She had to find out where she was. She just like was one second she's driving on through it. Next second, she's like behind some gravel pit. And so afterwards she started having all this stuff like, oh, your ancestors, we're talking to you. Like these voices in her head are her ancestors. Mm -hmm. And they said, we want you to go to the tea aisle. Like she kind of got the idea that all her ancestors were shamans and that mm. she was being told to become a shaman. She since has done a lot of shamanic work, but she, this, I love this part. So she said, these beings, all these voices in her head said, we are your ancestors. We want you to go to the grocery store. We want you to go to the tea aisle. We want you to pick up every box of tea and read the ingredients in the back of the tea box. So she goes to the grocery store. She picks up the tea box and she reads the ingredients and it's like spearmint leaves mint leaves and she, and she said she could hear the people sort of going oh, mm, oh mm. and the implication is the way she described it is that they used to live here on earth mm -hmm. and they drank tea they're not here on earth anymore they can't have yeah. that physical sensation mm -hmm. of drinking tea so they had her go to the tea aisle and read all wow. the ingredients you know lemongrass and you could she could hear them going oh mm, mm. Wow. so like who would make that up? Right. 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 Yeah. Like so, it, but that feels like 
like so when when like how to say this like you know all the stuff about the freaking tic tac i'm so bored with that you know like why like like i want to know if if the pilots are doing reiki or like if like the guy in the radar <laughs> room has been seeing owls and i want to know if like, like there's like psychic know. things that you know like did, like is well the military definitely has put some efforts into stuff like that you know these uh yeah, they definitely have, and they've they've looked into a lot of different aspects of, of the UFO phenomenon. Phenomenon, but you know, it's, it's That's one of the not funny things showing that, up in the news. Yeah, no, but I think it's. Yeah. I always think it's funny because the people who who really don't follow the UFO phenomenon like closely, they they don't have any idea of like once you kind of peel back the layers a little bit, how profound some of the information that that you you pick up on and, and read about and learn about from people how just profound it really is and it just challenges everything that you would ever believe in reality and i think it's amazing you know but like you said i i want to know i want to dig into the deeper aspects not of like oh how's it flying that kind of thing but i want to know you know the conscious aspects of it how is that involved Definitely. you know i another thing too is like at the end of the day, I, I realize that you don't you don't know what all this means, but we're we're living at a point in time in human history, with with UFOs being in the news. I feel like we are honestly living in the most pinnacle point in human history right now. Um, but what do you think that all of this means to you? And I know it's just an idea, and you're not stating a fact like this is what it is. They come from Zeta Reticula, that kind of thing. But what do you think all of this really means at the end of the day? So earlier I said, I live in a magical universe. That's one nice way to say it. Like, wow, there's like, ma you know, like magic is a, f I use that term on purpose, mm -hmm. partially just because it annoys the, the, the sort of, sort of materialist thinkers. Yeah. You know, I could say it a different way. I could say we live in a quantum universe. I could say mm -hmm. we live in a multi-layered universe, but I just, magic is, that's fine yeah. for me. I'm a, I draw cartoons. I used to draw cartoons for a living and I taught people how to, you know, build in igloos and the Alaska and stuff like that. So I don't have, I'm not beholden to the scientific process. Let me put it that way. So I would say in my work, like at the end of the day, if someone read one of my books, I would want them to come away with a, with a, I don't want to say even a knowing, but let's just say a, I would have told them a story in a way that they could have entertained and get, get gotten, pulled along and immersed in the story that's a nice way to say it that they could be immersed in a story where mm -hmm. our reality is much richer mm -hmm. much more nuanced much more playful much more multi-layered than we were told in junior high school science absolutely class, than more absolutely than, and you know there's i'm just, you know like I don't know, like boy the there's some wonderful accounts in the bible that sound mm -hmm. like that proof of there's multi multiple yep. layers of reality and so there's multiple there's in science fiction there's all kinds of stuff with multiple layers of reality but through this these stories specifically through the owl stories that that, that for me that there is a deeper reality running parallel to our own reality how it overlaps how mm -hmm. it intertwines is is unknowable because we are yeah. stuck in this side whatever's going on they can my sense is they can look into our reality mm -hmm. we cannot yeah. look out into theirs yeah hmm. and and that there's some interaction going on it's playful and it's meant it's here for some purpose i they wouldn't be doing it yeah if it wasn't somehow important I think so it's it, almost an education it is it is an awareness highlight i think the more people have experiences, uh, people encounter this phenomenon, it's life changing, it's, it's consciously changing. And I think that a lot of this stuff is just by design, that it's little seeds to, to have to create that awakening with inside of us. You know, and it's I've always used this term for like, you know, the ants out in your yard, they have no awareness that there's airplanes in the sky that we're sitting here doing a podcast together, that we, we have jobs and we have cars and all these things. They have no idea. They're just living in their own little world. And I kind of feel like humanity, you know, we tend to think that we are the end all be all. And I, and I disagree with that because I think that this is just a beginning for us. But I tend to believe that we are no different in an, 
in certain aspects of that we're we're just now becoming aware of different uh, different realities different aspects of our own consciousness and through these little moments or profound moments of ufo encounters or paranormal encounters mm -hmm. this is creating a major awareness that we're able to bust through that um the box so to speak and that we're becoming more aware of of what is yeah and we're doing it through these odd stories mm -hmm. right it's not some it's not it's not like someone's doing mathematical computations on a chalkboard that we're supposed to like delve into the deeper reality yeah. we're you know it's like here let me tell one story here this is a story i love so much and and it and it speaks to the 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 strangeness of the owl thing it's so this woman is coming home she's pulling in the driveway she's talking on the phone to her dad she pulls in the driveway and there's an owl in the driveway and it flies first she thinks it's a little kid it flies up into a tree so she gets out of the car and she gets on her phone and calls her son and says get out here there's an owl in the tree you got to see this so her son comes out the owl flies off the tree touches the top of her head and then flies off and her son is like mom are you okay are you okay and she's like oh wow wow no it was so gentle so she she shares a bunch of stuff about her life and she says later after that she went um on a hike with a friend and they came back to the trailhead and it had gotten dark which they weren't, weren't worried about that so they get back to the trailhead they're having a wonderful conversation and when they get back to the trailhead they look up and there's this craft that goes right over the top of their of their where they were standing in the parking lot and it and they got a picture of it it's not much to see it looks like just some dots in the sky so she so and then and then she says um and then everything in the parking lot turned red like the asphalt turned red the trees turned hmm. red all the cars turned hmm. red and she's got a picture of it like the asphalt looks like licorice like cherry licorice or something wait a minute she, she has a physical picture of that or? she got a physical picture of it, it doesn't i mean wow. to me if I, if you wanted to fake it all you'd have to do is like take the picture you know a little slider right, you have like right. just change enhance the color so yeah but like i'm not the, the proof let me tell you the her her storytelling and the emotion in her voice was so much more mm. important than the picture but there's a picture of the asphalt looks like cherry licorice um so and then she says you know i was um my son plays the league baseball and I was at the little league baseball game and the woman next to me, just a, another mom, I don't know her really. She's like, what's going on? And we started talking and she said, she said, this woman said, I need to, I need my kidney replaced or I'll die. Wow. And the lady said, I'll give you mine. She just said, I said, why did you say that? And she said, I don't know. I just felt it. I just, I just said it. I'll give you mine. Mm, wow. She, the lady said, well, it doesn't work that way. Right, so we have to be compatible. You have to run some tests. The doctors have to, you know, we have to. There's some research that needs to be done. We have to be compatible, or, or I'll reject the kidney. She said, "I'll take the test." So she goes. She goes to the doctor. She gets the test. The doctor later comes back to her and said, "Is this your sister?" She said, "No, this is just a lady in the neighborhood. I don't even know her really." It's like, well, I was actually going to ask, "Is this your twin sister?" I've never seen anyone so compatible. Wow. And then, so she gives her kidney away. And she's and I said, "How you doing?" I said, "I'm fine, doing great." How's the other woman doing? She's doing great. So, I asked the question I ask is, "What was going on in your life leading up to the event?" She was on the phone, pulling into the driveway, telling her father, "I think I'm going to give my kidney. I'm going to give my kidney away to this complete stranger." Mm. Sees wow. an owl. Owl touches her head. She sees a UFO. Everything turns red. She gives her kidney away, and. And every and it's like she saved a woman's life. She's doing fine. This is this is what's embedded into these stories. Like there's yeah. like there's there's like there's no meaning to that story except how it makes me feel. I yeah. don't know how it makes you feel, but yeah. like when I heard that story, I was like, it's, it's wow. profound. I didn't have to ask if she was a Reiki healer, right? She's doing healing work. Mm -hmm. Like she's yeah. like it's like that's like like I don't know if I would give a, my kidney away to a stranger. yeah. That's a that's a tough one. Yeah. So. Do you think there is a message in these stories and these experiences people are having? Do you think, like, I know you've studied this for a while, but do you, have you come across a similarity between all of them that you think this might be the main reason for it? Any commonalities? Ooh, there's so many commonalities. So that's what I said before, the same flavor and mood. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So here's a, so I 
got a message from a woman. <clears throat> she was, she's now a happy grandmother. That's how our letter started. And we had a bunch of back and forth correspondence. I initially, I shared this story. I had to put the disclaimer, said this is a one-off. Like I don't share the stories unless there's like a pattern. Yeah. Like that story of the woman in the, in the, giving her kidney away like i don't have that exact story but i have a lot of stories with that flavor and mood yeah so so like that lady's not alone people have had similar experiences this woman happy grandmother gets hold of me said when i was a teenager she said when i was a teenager i was severely depressed severe dangerously depressed i was on my way to kill myself i was i was in my dad's car i had a hose in the back of the car i was going to go to a park there was a spot in the woods i was going to park the car and I had a pillow. I brought my pillow from home. I was going to lay in the back seat, put my head on the pillow, and let and take the hose from the tailpipe and bring it in. Mm. She was she was slowing down to turn into the to the pullout in the woods. To and this owl flew right up to the windshield. And she said this owl flapped, hovered in space. She said it felt like it was there for. She said it probably only there for a couple seconds, but it felt like it was thirty seconds. We locked eyes. And I took it as a sign, and I turned around and went home. Thank God. Yeah. So there, so, so, wow, you do not, yeah, that is unquestionably, that owl saved her life. Yeah. I have a lot of stories of people driving down the road, Mm. right? Like, oh, they're going fast, driving down the road, and then slowly, the highway, twisty, turny. All of a sudden, there's an owl in the road, real owl, and they kind of, whoa, they got to put on the brakes. Or an owl flies right in front of the windshield. Whoa, they got to put on the brakes. Mm-hmm. And then just as they put on the brakes, another car comes screening around the corner and had passed into their lane. If they hadn't put on the brakes, they would be dead. So I got a lot of stories wow. about owls saving people's lives. So that, But that one is particular. I sense the it's woman amazing. with the suicide or, or like going to to kill herself mm-hmm. yeah i i have multiples of that now i didn't at the time and when i th- used to tell the story i would say that this is a one-off so i so just understand that i generally don't want to share a story unless i see it as a pattern so yeah. the benevolence of this stuff like i got i got it in the stories it's there wow is yeah. it there thanks for sharing that yeah oh, wow this just kind of popped in my mind. Um, what did? How do you interpret the the Mothman sightings? That was kind of an owlish type figure. I know it wasn't necessarily, oh, yeah. you know, a owl, but whenever you see the 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 depictions of what it looked like, it did have a owl type look. Um, have you put any thought into that, nor interpreted mm-hmm. that in any any shape or form? Yeah, and so so. Um... There's a very similar set of events that took place in England in the 1970s. And that was called the Owl Man. Mm. And, and it plays out just like the um, Mothman sighting. So one of the things that was consistent when people would see the Mothman, if you read Keel's book or um, The Silver Bridge by Gray Barker, there's like when people would see yeah. the, the apparition itself, they mm-hmm. were just flooded with a sense of doom, mm-hmm. a palpable sense of doom. That was consistent. Um, and that was also consistent in England where they called it the Owl Man. It doesn't, there's like images that were drawn by children and it looks essentially like the, the Mothman character. So mm-hmm. I... I there's some UFO type stuff related to to the accounts. I, I share a little bit of that in the chapter. I did a chapter on the Owl Man in the in the the Owl Man of Monwick. I think that's right. It was in Cornish, in the Cornish part of England. Um, hmm. So, but very little besides the name Owl Man. There's really not much that relates it to the owl. So, um, and there was also a point in. Um, the the John Keel book, where they the they found a big giant, not a big giant, a, a, like a very healthy big, normal Arctic snowy owl. They found a snowy owl in a field dead, and they brought the witnesses to the field, 
to say, was, is this what you saw, what you thought you saw? And they all said, no, absolutely not. This little dinky thing, no, this is just an owl. We did not see this. So there was an attempt to make like the debunkers, let's say the local, t the townsfolk were curious if it could have been an owl and the actual witnesses said, no way. Wow. So, you know, what's what's next for Mike Cleland? I mean, we got a few minutes left. I mean, you, you've you've done such a fantastic work just putting all these stories together. But how do you how do you evolve this? How do you what is your continuation with this? What are your <laughs> ideas and goals and how do you want to? Is there any changing it up, so to speak, or is it just a continued evolution? There, I did change it up. I did change it up. So so I starting around 2019 like whoosh, like i kind of went underground i didn't like and mm. then covid and stuff like that i was so i wrote a fiction book so i wrote a novel so tell us a, about it uh it is a it's uh it started out as a comic book i was an illustrator for a long time so i wanted to oh, do cool. this as a comic oh, yes. book and i and i started and i talked to a few people i knew some people that worked in the comic book industry and they all like said like you don't want to do a comic book alone you'll go crazy It'll break you. <laughs> like, like wow. if you're gonna do a comic book, you need a team. You need like a guy to do the inking. You need a guy to do the coloring. You need like an overseer. You need someone to do the lettering. And like, I was gonna wow. do it all myself. I was on fire for a while, and I was like, yeah. "Oops!" And so I kind of put it away. I had a treatment, so I pulled that treatment out, and so it's been really well received. It's been out a month. That's awesome. Really, June, June twenty. So a month and a month, a little over a month, came out in in May, mid May. So it's a. It's a, it's a, I've taken, so all this is over a decade of owls, collecting owl stories. Mm -hmm. So, so I took a lot of those and cherry picked them and kind of massaged them a little bit to fit into the storyline. So I've had people get back to me and say like, what was like, that was so weird. Your book is so weird. I'm like, oh, it's kind of weird. <laughs> like, like, what about that one scene? I'm like that, what, what about that one? I'm like, oh, that happened. That happened. It's a real story. That's a real story. Wow. It did happen like, but it was like happened a little differently, but I yeah. fit it into the, yeah. and, and, um, so earlier I said, I've said it a bunch of times, the same flavor and mood. I wanted to saturate this story with the flavor and mood of, of the accounts mm. I've been receiving. And, and, and with, with the, um, the kind of unknowing, like there's a main mm. character who's thrust into this mystery. So the, first one third of it is this character who's a little bit based on me walk it's like a he uh he, all these odd events happen to him he's he's out alone in the desert and all these things and he's having this internal dialogue and then the second two-thirds of it roughly is a detective novel I love okay, detective cool. novels. I love Raymond Chandler. And so it's a mm. detective novel in a sense where this guy then plays the detective and is like, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to solve this. Cool. Whether he solves it is a little mm. ambiguous. But so so the first of it is like this kind of internal drama. And the second part of it, part two, is a detective novel where he has to to unravel the mystery. Now, it's a UFO book. I never use the word UFO. Mm. I never, it's a tons of synchronicities. I never use the word synchronicity. I purposely wanted to kind of undertell some aspects of it. Here's what I wanted. It's just, I wanted someone who had no knowledge of UFOs. I wanted someone who had no knowledge of synchronicities to pick this book up, read the whole thing, and yeah. not even know it was about UFOs. Well, I don't know whether I would, I don't, I'm, I don't think I succeeded, but, um, <laughs> but that was my goal when I was writing it, so. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, you, know, you know, are you, what are you, what are you doing these days? Are you still taking in owl reports? Are you, no. is there other projects? I mean, I'm going to open my email. I'll tell you how many I got today. I, I got mean, like four today and they were good, like good, powerful, solid reports. Four. Yeah. I can't, uh, like, how, like it's a full-time job just answering my email. Yeah. I mean, uh, how many, how many would you get on a week? I mean, I mean, just a, just a guess of it. Just, I mean, let's roughly, let's say one good one. I get a lot. So like some of them yeah. aren't that I want to be careful because I'm happy that people send them to me. But some people just say like, I saw an owl land on my fence. It was so beautiful. And like, yeah. I send a note back. Thank you. That's a good thing. They you. just wanted to share their owl story. And then other ones are like, wow. Yeah. Like, you know, I got one where like this in the, some of it's in the book where like, you know, I mean, just like mm -hmm. psychic events and paranormal events and, and, and wow, do they get heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I've told some of them here. So, so um, one a day. So okay. you do that. Multiply one a day by 
is 14 years. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> is this something that you, you want to continue to stay on as far as the owl topic, or are you planning on bra branching off and doing other paranormal aspects of, of ideas and experiences? And well, and I do branch off with other ideas about, I mean, that's this, this, there's owls. There's certainly owls in this fiction right. book. And, and, um, but I'm, but I'm branching off in the sense that, um, you know, like I, if someone tells me a good story that that's all I'm really concerned yeah. about. Like I'm the, the, like, yeah, the owl is unimportant. The owl is a symbol on a door. Right. That would be the, so I'm, I'm more, I'm more inter, I'm very dedicated to the, the mystique of the mm. story. So like, like I'm not trying to figure out how the crafts fly. Right. I'm not trying to, to figure out which state has the most UFO sightings. I like, I'm not interested in it. I want, that's all the boring stuff. Anyways, I want the yeah. story to be told with whether it's in a book of nonfiction book or whether it's in a fiction book, I want the story to be told in a way that imbues the reader with a sense of mystery and awe yeah. and hopefully in a way that will change their definition of reality, how yeah. they perceive their place in reality. That's a tall order, but that's, that's what happened to me and that's what I want to share. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you've done it. I think you have, uh, and I tell you, anybody listening to this, I really high, highly recommend uh, checking out Mike's book, The Messengers. It is a fantastic read. I actually have it on the the Audible. Version. Oh, that's right. Michael Hacker wrote it. Yeah. Did a beautiful job reading it. Yeah, yeah. he was a great job. So I got, I'm a, I'm not my, with my ADD. I'm more of a I'm more of an Audible kind of guy. I, I usually I'm, like that while I'm driving. So I, I read the other two books. So there's. So there's four books now. So I'll do this. I, I showed you three books before. I'll show you. Yeah, four. please, please uh, so tell four. us all your all of your books real quick. Okay. So here's the here they are stacked up. One, two, three, four. There's four books. It's about it's about um, one thousand three hundred and fifty pages. So they all go backwards. This is the newest one. This is the unseen. This is mm -hmm. the the novel that I just and it started out as a comic book, and then and then I'll start from the beginning of the. This is the messengers. This is the first one. This is what I sometimes call the blue book. It's kind of shiny. Fantastic here. book. Yeah. So the blue book, and that this is the one that where I tried to make the case that owls and UFOs are somehow connected. Mm -hmm. It took about four hundred pages. This is called Stories from the Messengers. If you liked the first one, get this that, one because this that's is, my next one to pick this up. Is, and I read the audiobook of this one, and and the. Uh, that's a plus. I always love it when the authors actually read the book. Yeah, and I and I it was it was it's hard work to read. Wow, and I, I really I'm terrible at reading a lot. I can but imagine. This, this is um, this was ex essentially stories that didn't fit in the first mm -hmm. one, and stories that were more complex. Mm. So this is there's 19 chapters. It reads like 19 short stories, and each story is a is a somewhat complex set of events. I I gotta ask: Are the stories, are they? Is there a wide variety of like mm -hmm. how they are a oh, good to know? That's yeah, good to know. Really wide, all over the people in England, people in you know all over the yeah. Gotcha. So it's it's um people in Canada, people in the United States, all kinds of different aspects of it. Yeah. Gotcha. So I and and the um and then the last three chapters were I'm really proud. It's, I can't go into it now, but the last three chapters sort of sum it up in a really subtle delicate way because it was a difficult thing to to get all that to coalesce mm -hmm. but and then the third in that series was i had a blog i still have the blog i don't i don't post much on the blog in the same way i used to this is called hidden experience that's the name of my blog that was that was uh when the blog turned 10 years old i realized what had happened is i had been blogging real time that story of Kristen at the began it was like that was like the mm -hmm. second or third post i had been yeah. blogging real time about my coming to terms with this. Remember I said like I spent 95% of my waking hours wondering if I had gone insane. That was, that's the meat of that book, The Hidden Experience, where I'm going through, which I did very publicly, mm -hmm. like like instead of saying, oh, I had this interesting thing happen 10 years ago, I, I would like these blog posts were like, this thing happened this morning and I'm trying wow. to make sense of it right now. So yeah. so it, it in the moment, like honest, you're just in real time. Yeah. And this, this, I will also say that this one, some people write reviews on Amazon. They're like, I didn't get it. Didn't, didn't work for me at all. Didn't get it. <laughs> and then people who have had the experience, people who have like basically, yeah. basic, who've had the contact experience will get back to me or even just like paranormal experiences. They'll get back to me and say, thank you so much. You wrote the book that 
that I am I can't write because I have this job and my wife and this thing and yeah. my kids and the school. I couldn't tell my story, but you in in writing that book, you told it for me. Wow. So Don't that's, you love that? that's that's beautiful. That meant a huge amount to me. So. I can imagine. Well, Mike, if people want to learn more about you and and the work that you do, um, tell them how they can find you. Uh, if you want, you can go, you can type in owls UFO, and I'm the first thing that comes up, and I'm about the next 25 things under that. And the, or you can go to mikecleland.com, um, and then uh, from there you can go to the blog. I ran a podcast for a couple of years at a number of sites. I ran two different podcasts, and so all of those are oh, wow. archived there. Um, the books are archived there, so you can just click on a link on the Mike Cleland site, and it'll take you right to Amazon for those books. Awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody, definitely check out Mike's books. They're incredible, that's for sure. Uh, and Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, this is you. a huge honor for me. I'm a big fan of your work, and, and this has been an incredible conversation. I really appreciate you kind of deep diving in, into this topic with us and really uh, shedding light on this, and I think people are going to be pretty blown away when they hear this. Great. It's my honor. It's been a delight. Well, thank you so much. And uh, guys, I guess that's going to be it for us tonight. Uh, until next time, see you then. Yeah, later. Bye now.